12 miles west of Wilson is the Niagara Bar, where the Niagara River flows into Lake Ontario. It's the perfect storm of nutrient-rich water, which attracts schools of bait fish and big salmon. And they're here for one reason, the pack on the pounds. You won't find a higher concentration of kings in the Great Lakes than right here, right now. The fishing can be challenging. Unpredictable currents can throw off your presentation. My clients expect me to put fish in the boat. Knowing the speed and temperature at depth is always important, but here it's imperative. If you don't have a fish hawk, you're dead in the water. Now, Fishhawk is charging ahead. The new Lithium Series incorporates four decades of experience with the Lithium power anglers expect in modern electronics. The maintenance-free probe is 40% smaller and has an internal Lithium polymer battery that provides a weekend's worth of fishing on a single charge. Wireless smart charging recharges the probe in minutes. Optional Bluetooth communication and probe depth are also available. I wouldn't dream of fishing without a Fishhawk. And now with the new Lithium Series, Fishhawk electronics are better than ever. And the printer broke. Good afternoon. We are at the Greater Niagara Fishing Expo in Niagara Falls, New York, and it is the last session of this year's Great Lakes Fishing Podcast roadshow here in new york and i'm chris larson joined by pete alex kevin pete how you doing good chris good to see you again yeah good to have you on the show again uh you guys spent pretty much all the day yesterday in the classroom teaching the uh, lots of salmon school yep. tell us a little bit about that i'm kind of burnt out yeah these guys are getting a lot of mileage out of me this weekend right you're, you're tapping into it too but uh, we, had, we had a great school uh, you know, I did it with Captain Casey Frisco, a.k.a. Superman, mm -hmm. and then uh, Captain Rob Westcott, also man, known as Mr. Consistency. Mm -hmm. But it was fun. The whole process was fun with those guys. You know, it started, uh, heck, probably 10 months ago, and then we touched base off and on during this season. And then we started putting this whole thing together. We met last week, so a lot of, a lot of communication once we decided, if, or I'd say lots of folks decided it was going to be us three. Mm -hmm. A lot of planning, a lot of pictures, a lot of uh, info sharing, spending time talking, talking fishing more. But it was a it was a good time overall. And I got to tap into their minds a little bit more through the whole process. Yeah. Which was good for me. No. Yeah, you're pretty well known known as a guy that knows what he's talking about when he's out on the boat. But what, what can you learn when you're in that room with those two guys and you're working on getting everything set up for the school? I'd say they're probably uh, in the top 5% of ball busters. You know, yeah. I learned that. I mean, we I learned that, that before. Right? We learned that during. So, uh, no, I, I learned that they uh, we have some similar processes, how we fish. You know, the mental aspect of fishing is one of the subjects we talked about, the mental processes that we go through. Mm -hmm. So we were very similar. We're all very competitive mm -hmm. for the most part. We have some different techniques. We differ, differentiate there, but, you know, it'd be boring if we did everything the same, right? Exactly, right. Totally boring. So, so it was good to hear their perspective on things versus my perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's good fish head talk, I call it, right. with those guys. Yeah, I, I heard from a lot of people in this room here, uh, basically since the sessions end la ended last night, uh, just about what they learned and what they picked up from you three guys up there talking. And, and they just they said it was a great show, basically. You know, it was just a great opportunity for them to kind of see what's going on. What was some of the feedback that you heard from the people in the room? All positive. You know, uh, a lot of handshakes afterwards, mm -hmm. thanking us for the presentation. And thanks for being honest, you know, giving up a lot of things that we do that maybe we didn't want to share with people because mm -hmm. that kind of gives us an edge. We kind of always like to have that edge and not tell people. But 
Casey and Rob kind of gave it all up. Like there was no like, I'm gonna show them fifty percent, keep fifty. Mm -hmm. They pretty much let it rip as well as I do. So I think a lot of people saw that. Yeah, they knew it was genuine, and uh, we dumped a lot of info out there for a lot. And you guys are doing this again here in another month over on the east side of the lake. Yep, down by Pulaski, New York. Mm -hmm. That was Casey's idea, really. Um, he said, why not? He thought there was a need for it. You know, our show sold out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people who couldn't make the party. And uh, so he's like, let's have one on the east end. Mm -hmm. A lot of people there didn't want to travel a distance or, or miss the tip, ticket opportunity. So he said, let's have one there. So we all agreed. Okay, let's pick, pick a weekend that works for us. So we'll move that down there on March 9th. Yeah. And that's going to be probably 70 percent kings 30 percent brown trout something like that yeah we're going to concentrate on browns kings a little variety from what we did here right so then that's kind of what casey said you know he's like we'll be talking about a lot of the same things but we can't you know it's it's a different show down there. there's a lot of little different things going on down there you got the brown trout down there that it's not really a, a i guess as coveted as a fish down here on this end as it is down there but right. uh talking some brown trout and that show is also filled up but you you know you said this is the fifth time you've done the lots of show you were telling me before we went on the air if people want to get in on this for next year i mean i think what they probably should hear out of this is that they should probably go to this if they want to learn and become a better angler how do they sign up for this lots of sport well it was the fourth or fifth time so how do they sign up well they they have to wait for the announcement to come which is uh the announcement usually uh -oh. from memory doesn't really get put out there till maybe november so i would say when they when that announcement the announcement does get to put out there yeah. don't wait <laughs> get on don't it right wait. away you gotta get on if you're gonna go go really there's a wealth of information and then just like i told everybody in the school yesterday you know all the different guys I've done this with, and I've had guys from Michigan that do it with me, uh, guys from the East End, some really good fishermen. Everybody's willing to share. Like, mm -hmm. there's not that guy that kind of holds back, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty cool. Everybody's very eager to let 30, 40 years of experience out during eight hours and then answer questions freely with mm -hmm. no holdback, right. which is doesn't happen in our business very yeah. often yeah it's a big deal where'd you go where'd you catch your fish today chris right <laughs> out there right in the water in the water out there yeah okay so you get a lot of that doc talk right but it was it was fun and uh, a lot of info went out yeah we always have one i'm sure you've heard this a million times it's uh where'd you catch them in the mouth in the mouth. all of them right in the mouth smart smarty pants yeah you know, guys and then this morning we had a follow-up to that we had a uh, about an hour and a half question and answer seminar mm -hmm. specifically for the attendees they had the benefit of coming in another day mm -hmm. and meet the three of us in the same conference room and uh fire away questions anything you want what colors what's your favorite colors what's your favorite rigs you know water stuff temperature stuff so it was another 90 minutes of whatever you want to hear we'll, we'll answer to the best of our experience and knowledge and can't go wrong with that what was the most interesting question that was asked of you this morning uh, i would say like visual currents like if you see visual stuff happening on on top of water how do you fish it mm -hmm. on the left side of it the inside of it what do you look for down below so that was, that was kind of outside the box question a little more technical question mm -hmm. so you know we all the three of us kind of all took a poke at it you know sometimes you look for a temperature break when you see that water change and you notice you get bit did you get bit on the cold side or the warm side right mm -hmm. so pay attention sometimes those breaks wander the wander in the wander out so the answer is you know follow those breaks pay attention to everything around them and then the clues, all the clues kind of fill themselves in, if you're paying attention. We're speaking with Captain Pete Alex this morning, and Pete will be, I guess it's the afternoon here on the East Coast. Yep. Um, Pete will be with us here for the next two hours, and uh, if you want a chance to win that prize pack today, it's hashtag Captain Pete. Hashtag Captain Pete will get you into the drawing 
for the Fishhawk swag package today. So go ahead and drop that in your comments. And if you have any questions for Captain Pete Alex, go ahead and drop them in the comments and we'll get those Captain Pete here before we call it a day. Um, we've got a couple more guests coming up. We'll be with you here for about two hours today. Captain, what do you have going on this year? What are you? What's going on for 2024 for Vision Quest? Probably same old, same old. You know, gonna start getting into the boat, the boat mode here pretty soon. As soon as the weather breaks at the end of this month, start prepping the boats, getting stuff ready. Uh, we're, we're gonna hit it hard coming out of the gate at the west end of Lake Ontario, but we're gonna start in Erie uh, early April this year. We fish there for about three weeks, fish a little tournament up there, and then that. We transition basically to all up here, mm -hmm. and our first tournament will be the King of the Lake at the la during the last weekend of April. So that'll be the first tournament for us. We're always excited. That that gets a, a lot of uh, attention. A lot of people turn out. Everybody's amped to go fishing. Great place to fish uh, out there in uh, Canada by Port Dalhousie, Welland Canal, Niagara River. It's all happening for Kings, mm -hmm. and you get have some phenomenal fishing out there. So. And you start in Wilson. Uh, tell us about what's special about that port. It's like a little hamlet, you know. It's mm -hmm. kind of off the grid. Uh, nice community. Uh, some really good fishermen come down there. You know, a lot of fishermen migrate down there and park their boats for a month and, you know, fish with us. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fishing opportunities. we got cohos happening. got outstanding lake trout fishing if you want to catch lake trout. Of course, kings. Probably, probably the, arguably the best king fishing in the United States occurs there for about six, seven weeks for a lot of reasons. And uh, it's really a dynamic place. A lot of, There's a lot of fishing activity. So if you're a fish head, you want to go mill around, talk fishing to different guys, see guys from down the lake, come there and visit, you know, hang out, exchange tactics, barbs, whatever you want. So it's a really fishy time mm -hmm. because then Wilson dials down like, as soon as that spring bonanza of salmon go, you start to get into June. And all those guys go back to their home ports mm -hmm. and uh, fishing tapers off a little bit. You know, transition occurs. Fishing gets tougher. Fish are spreading out. And the whole place in Wilson goes from a mega fishing community for about six weeks to a normal little hamlet with guys going fishing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you is like, Everybody comes there. You have the migration. You know, Prisco shows up. A Jackie shows up. It gets quiet when some of those guys leave. To be honest with you, yeah, it's quieter. Yeah, I think that's natural. But <laughs> the only cool thing is, you know, I was there with you guys a couple of years ago, and like you said, you know, you could just go down there and just hang out. I mean, it's just kind of fun to see the boats come in and just you guys are all hanging out and kind of cleaning things up in the afternoon, and um, it's just a it's a fun atmosphere. It is. It's a period of time you look forward to every year, really. And when it goes, you miss it. And then you look forward to the next year. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting into that. I'm getting ready now. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Fired up to go. Fired up. Wow. What What causes that? You talked a little bit about, you know, though that area there has just got some things that, that make it appealing to the salmon in May. What is it that, that makes that place a salmon mecca that time of year? Well, a few things. Uh, the lake shallows up at the west end, you know, in the Canadian waters. It makes like a bowl down there, so it warms up quicker. Of course, it's almost like Lear Erie, you know, west end of Lake Erie. It's very similar. Shallow, warms up quick. Mm -hmm. A lot of the walleyes migrate down in Erie all the way to that end for the winter. A lot of the salmon in Lake Ontario migrate towards the west end and winter out in that deep water. And uh, then we got the mighty, mighty what? Niagara. Niagara. I'm going to test you. So we got the mighty Niagara. A million gallons a minute of Lake Erie water, which is typically warming by then. Going into that, creating current, a bait attraction, to Mecca. Yeah. A lot going on. So you got the warming west end. You got fish coming out of that deep water where they wintered, mm -hmm. starting to migrate in. It's that time they want to come in and eat. You got bait showing up because the warming water and current and all that. They want to come in. You got some spawning that occurs later. Also, in your ALI start to come in to spawn. Everything's, you know, the roses are starting to bud, as right. you say, right? right. So. A million gallons of wa water a minute. That's that's amazing. You don't really think about it, but I guess when you walk out here and you see the falls, you're like, 
You take yeah, a look at sense. that. It's impressive. Yeah, there's a lot of water coming over. It's like impressive. That. So, so and it's whatever you want to call it, natural progression or whatever, the migration, but they end up down there. And um, so not always, but obviously it starts out usually hot and heavy at that west end. Mm-hmm. When we get winters like this we're, that are occurring, sometimes those when those fish start to come in, they kind of bypass uh, Wilson, Alcott, not all of them, but they'll start spreading out because of the warmth. Mm-hmm. And they'll bypass, and we don't have the glut of fish that we often do when we have hard winters. Mm-hmm. It'll be more of a spread out situation, which I'm kind of expecting that. Still great fishing, but the guys uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles, 80 miles down the lake might see spring kings on their, on their doorstep here uh, this spring. Yeah, so it'll be a little bit different. A little different. Type of season. Um, can you talk to the audience about kind of what what that's like fishing out there that time of year um you know what are you doing how are you setting your gear up and, and what what a typical day out there looks like in may and wilson typical typical day is you know we're gonna leave the dock about by about 5 30 you know the early bird bird gets the worm um kings are notorious for uh a biting early you know there's a good bite for two hours typically so we're gonna leave dock early and we're going to let uh, water dictate, water color dictate. Are we going to set up in 60 feet, 70, 80 feet, 300 feet? Mm-hmm. You know, we get a lot of northeast wind that time of year, and it kind of wrecks havoc on the water. It'll roll that nice inside stuff way out. Mm-hmm. So we could be in 300 or 400 feet in May, and we might be crushing kings in 40 to 60. Yeah. And then uh, what's nice about the Niagara River, it'll help spread those fish out. It'll, you don't have to be at the mouth of the Niagara River to catch kings. You could be maybe six miles away, four miles away, three miles away, ten miles away, and still have a good king cut off the tip. Because that water's all flowing easterly. Now, except you get a bad northeast wind. Right. That changes, pushes pushes a lot of kings back into Canada, or blows them way offshore. And just with, with all the different things that all different factors there is it one of those things where when you go out in the morning you know they're not often where you left in the day before or you go out there and kind of go back to where you were the day before if there wasn't a weather event wind event typically we're going to go right back where we left them and, and they'll be there and they'll be close so when you have to make the adjustment what does that look like for me the adjustment is probably a north troll that's probably my first adjustment for a western troll. I'm going to keep trolling westerly or I might bump it out north. And you're looking for deeper water, though. Deeper water. There's a lot of kings that people miss all spring. Which I guess I'm going to give one up here. A lot of You see a lot of boat activity in, say, 60 to 120. It's just mm-hmm. kind of a common norm for any great lake, it seems, in spring. But there's a, usually another uh, line of fish out in that. 250 to 300 so there's a lot of days i don't like the boat traffic i'm gonna go right out to that deeper water fish a little different program and i uh, have the fish all to myself you know my friends get in trouble they call me yeah i'm sorry calling you looking for tips if, if they're slow yeah are those blue boats or they're tired of the boat traffic on the inside you know there's usually a couple different bands of kings you know the inside and usually there's some outside kids is that is it a spoon program? What do you what do you kind of run in the spring? For me, it's uh, a lot of spoons and then uh, a fair amount of meat, flashers okay. and meat. All right, very good. A little bit of flies. Anything else you wanted to touch on here before we bring in our first guest? No, really. Uh, good seeing you. Yeah. yeah this will be fun. It'll be a fun couple hours. Right. Co-hosting, and um, I'm looking forward to some of the guests that you have, just picking their brains or firing a few questions at them. Right. And. Uh, gonna be fun should be good why don't you slide over about two inches and we'll bring in calvin calvin come on over well hi calvin howdy <laughs> calvin vanderboon how you doing good how are you doing chris just excited to have you on the show and hanging out with us here uh last day of the greater niagara fishing expo so it's uh you know it's something that it's like we put it on the calendar and we're like, yeah, that's months away. And then all of a sudden you look down and you're like, it's next week. So uh, it kind of hits us like that every year, and it did so again this year. Um, 
but you're on here today. We're talking about a, a product that you developed. Uh, tell us about what we got going on. So I developed a product called uh, Strike Assist, and Pete's been helping the last couple of years. And basically, when fish feed, they create suction by opening their mouth rapidly, and they expect the bait to get sucked into their mouth. And when you're trolling, the line tension prevents the bait from moving towards them. And so the Strike Assist has a spring that's calibrated, so when they strike, it allows the bait to get sucked into their mouth, so the hooks go deeper into their mouth, and you're hooking more fish, and they're less likely to get off. Really interesting. How does it work? Um, what does it look like? So if you think about it, like a soda straw, yeah. it's about the same size as a straw. Okay. So it's a 3 8 inch diameter tube, clear, and it's nine inches long with a spring inside and a leader coming out the back. And when the fish hits, the spring extends until the leader hits the back of the tube, and then you're fighting the fish through the tube, so the spring can't overextend and get damaged. Very interesting. And you just clip your fishing line onto the front from your pole, you add a leader and your lure behind it, and send it. So, how did you even get this idea? How, how do you come up with something like this? So, I was watching, I, I enjoy trolling, and I was watching underwater trolling videos and watching fish strike up to six times and never get touched by a hook, and then just turn and swim away. And so, I just thought, well, why? And as soon as I asked that question, I have a science background, and I, I put the two things together, which is, fish are suction feeding and they're expecting that bait to come into their mouth mm -hmm. they're not trying to grab it like a mountain lion or a wolf would and so that was the aha moment interesting yes so yesterday we were talking you were telling me about all the underwater footage that you had and just the different ways that that fish bite yeah and, and i found that incredibly fascinating yeah. Can you share some of that with us? Yeah, so not only how they bite, then how they react after the bite, too. Mm -hmm. So there's two main ways that fish are going to feed. There's suction feeding, which they're going to do most of the time. If they have a spiny prey item and they suction feed it from behind, which is where they, they usually approach from behind because the prey can't see them. Mm -hmm. If they do that and they swallow it tail first and you have a spiny prey item, the spines will get stuck in their throat. And so when they feel like they're attacking a spiny prey item, they'll swim up from behind and they'll use a little bit of suction to pull it into their mouth. But what they're trying to do is grab it between their upper and lower jaw and salmon will crush it to wound the bait and walleye have teeth and they'll puncture it. And then they spit it back out and swallow it head first. Um, so large spiny bait items, they tend to head strike instead of tail strike. And then once they are, hooked if you're you're fishing with a bait once they're hooked the different species do different things so steelhead just go crazy they non-stop they thrash they jump yes. we can tell you that without looking at the video right <laughs> yeah but when you when you see i mean it it's re it's affirmation of what you know but when you see the strike and then see what a steelhead instantly does i mean well i, I steal a fishing streams and all that too and so i see you hook them and they just start this F revolution of craziness you see why people lose a lot of steelhead and mm -hmm. he had one uh one or two underwater uh videos on the boat of just instant as soon as i like touch the bait and got it ah, i'm hooked just this whirling dervish thing going on down below like like crazy if you lassoed a chipmunk <laughs> that's about what it does right they just go like fast the fight for life like goes wild for steelheads yeah mm -hmm. all right yeah lake trout go dead bug um once they're hooked they leave their mouth open and they just just completely dead bug they're, they're swinging down you can see their tail working and they're trying to push themselves down still mm -hmm. and every once in a while they'll do a head shake mm -hmm. but that's it they don't thrash and go crazy walleye will go spastic for one or two seconds and then they kind of succumb to the fact that they're hooked and then what's weird about walleye though is they'll swim along with the bait with their mouth closed so it doesn't register on the other end of rod you miss that first hit they'll just drag along for five minutes and then 
because I did that because I had dipsy divers that were tightened down too hard. So I had a walleye that I was dragging for 20 minutes and I got mm-hmm. to watch what happened when I didn't realize I had a fish on. Yeah. Um, but they, they become them. really easy to reel in, don't they? <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know they're there. And that right. was a, you know, like a six pound walleye. Mm-hmm. And you, you, they are not putting any action on the rod. You wouldn't know that they're there because they're swimming along with the bait. Mm-hmm. And then every once in a while, they'll shake their head again. But after that first couple seconds with the walleye, they just swim along with it. Mm-hmm. What so, about what about a king? So like that that the affirmation thing is like as an angler, you're up on a boat, you're up here, and the fish is down there. Mm-hmm. You can feel that or see it kind of through a rod, but when you see it under underwater, yeah. it's a bit it's it's affirmation of what you know and you felt, but it's you see it then. Yeah. Kinda, it's been super sure. interesting to watch underwater because you don't get to see that no. part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have footage from King It's. We've caught plenty of Kings on strikes this, but I didn't figure out the camera rig until too late. Mm-hmm. And then the Kings, I did catch the camera bat, like the camera itself dies quickly in cold water because it shuts down the electronics. The battery's still fine mm-hmm. and the memory card's fine, but you get about 15, 20 minutes in that cold water and then that's it. And I just wasn't getting, I wasn't able to get a King to bite before the camera died. And so I still need to get King, but I've got Sheephead and Walleye and Steelhead on mm-hmm. camera. But we've caught plenty of Steelhead and Browns and Kings, Cohos, Lake Trout, Sheephead. <laughs> not by, not not on purpose, <laughs> but we still caught it. Yeah, and you were telling me that your camera is 60 frames per second. Yep. So you literally were timing by frame like how long it takes for this fish to actually get the lure in its mouth yep so i I, like i said i come from a a science background and so i had researched you know published scientific papers and so i knew that the average fish strike lasts one twentieth of a second Mm -hmm. so that's from they swim up behind the bait they pop their mouth open and they close their mouth back again, they expect that that prey item is now in their mouth mm-hmm. in a 20th of a second. So with a camera that's 60 frames per second, you get three frames of strike and then it's over. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, it, it happens lightning fast. And so if you think about it, trolling without a strike sis, when they strike, you have one you have one twentieth of a second for that hook to get in the fish's mouth because mm-hmm. their mouth is only open for that period of time. Mm-hmm. And the only way that it happens is they have closing speed with the bait or it's called ram speed. And so when fish are super aggressive, they have a high closing speed with the bait. And so the hook can get in their mouth when, and, and when they're super aggressive, the strike assist is less important because they have that high closing speed. But when they're less aggressive, you can watch them swim up and stall out behind the bait and then strike with little or no closing speed, and then you're you're going to touch them with a hook, or you're not going to hook them at all. Without and then the strike sys obviously is very helpful at that in that scenario. All right, so tell me about the strike assist and we showed it a little bit, but uh, you kind of get into some details and, and it looks like you have two different versions here. Yep. Okay. So there's two models. Um, so different lures create different amounts of drag force. And then the faster you go, it creates additional drag force. Mm -hmm. And so if I just had the one model, then if you're fishing something like a crankbait, it's going to eventually bottom out the spring Mm -hmm. and there's no room left for it to extend. So then you need to size up to the model two. So like the model one, I call it a spoon feeder because it's going to be good for spoons. It's good for other things too, like flies and spinning glows um, and crawler harnesses at lower speeds. But if you're going to, and then the size two is, I call it plugs and cranks. And that's probably the one you're going to be using for things like mag lips and um, yeah. crank baits that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. or mag spoons at high speeds. So I've got a, a chart on the website and it shows different t- styles of lures. Mm-hmm. And then when you would switch from a model one to a model two based on the troll and speed. Well, you sound like a very scientific guy. So I'm guessing you'd have a lot of data yep. on what you get out of this. Yep. So tell me a little bit about the results of using this compared to just going out there and trolling the way everybody else does. So I put a lot of time and money into this. 
Mm -hmm. And before I did anything, I wanted to make sure that I could prove that it actually worked. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fishing products where, like, you think it works, but you can't really prove it. But mm -hmm. if you're catching more fish, I should be able to prove it. And so we worked with a group of captains, and they were giving me data and running rods with a strike sys versus without a strike sys on the same trip. Mm -hmm. And then giving me that data, and I was keeping track of the number of bites they were getting per bait and then how many fish they were landing, and you can compare the data. So we caught uh, 1,366 fish oh. over the last two years, and the strikes has averaged 35 or 36% more fish than not using the strikes. Assist. And that was including the first couple versions of the prototypes that had springs that were too stiff because they weren't made correctly mm -hmm. by the spring manufacturers um so they're correct now but basically because they were too stiff they weren't extending as much as they should mm -hmm. and so the final version now it's correct so in the last year with these springs we were um, there were some trips where we were catching three to six times as many fish on the strikes versus without and there was trips where it was pretty much breaking even um, but it averaged 47% more fish with the current prototypes or the most recent prototypes. And then you, and then you also chartered, like you chartered my boat yep. a couple of times, uh, last early last spring, as well as other people's. Yep. And I called you the secretary, like your job was with a clipboard yep. and we split the side, you know, half the boat was without half it was with a strike assist, mm -hmm. everything identical, like not like plugs over here, spoons, it, you kept it, you know, scientifically equal, like yep. you would say. And uh, all, he, all he did was with the clipboard was observed everything. But he did it with guys from all, a bunch of guys from Lake Michigan as well, right? Uh, one guy from Lake Erie, myself, and then and Michigan, Joe. Uh, and Joe, from, Joe from Lake Erie. And uh, so he also, like, did your data that oh, way yeah. by chartering boats specifically to collect yep. data, right? Yeah, we chartered boats, Lake Michigan, uh, two on Lake Michigan, one in Lake Northern Lake Huron, one in Southern Lake Huron, two in Erie, and one in Ontario. And then it was a lot of an ask for captains to keep track of all that data. And so I figured I better just go do it myself. So. It's the best way to make sure it gets done right. Yeah, and then obviously there's so many variables that go into it. Like a certain side of the boat might be catching fish better than the other. And so there's a lot of failure points in that data. Now you get a high volume of data like what we had and you get statistically significant results. But then eventually what it morphed into <laughs> was I want to figure out how can I actually see it happen underwater. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of failures in uh, what the camera rig was. But eventually we were able to get a setup where you can physically watch the fish open their mouth and you can watch the leader extend out of the strike assist when the lure gets sucked into their mouth um it was we we got very few fish on camera when the camera was still alive so it was very difficult to get that shot but we were able to get it on three different ones very cool and that's on the website all right i got a question here from jim and jim wants to know uh have you tested this on really deep chinook fishing um I don't know what really deep means, but yeah. it, it, it wouldn't make any difference whether it is deep or shallow. Um, right. The physics of it doesn't change. Um, I think the deepest that we caught kings, I don't know how deep you were catching kings on it, but I know on the boats chartered, we were catching kings at 90 feet. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't think of any reason why it would be any different to go deep. Right. Either way, I don't know what why that would matter, but yeah. ours were caught like average forty to ninety down, eighty down on average. Whether it was a lake trout or the kings we were catching, but ultra deep, I don't know if it would have mattered if it was a dipsy out in the abyss with this or a regular down in the abyss with it. Really. So <clears throat> one of the things that you said is we caught more fish with this. Yep. Do you was it more bites or? Same amount of bites, but just better fish retention, or less bites, but better retention. Will be, will so that did look like? that varied through the different prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, so, and something that came up the first year of testing was 
we had two captains that were running them. There was nine captains running it. Two of them were just having, like, they were not catching as many fish mm -hmm. with the strike sis versus without. And it took a while to figure out why, but they were fishing really clear water with spoons. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is the spring was deadening the action of spoons. So it wasn't as an aggressive of a pattern. Mm -hmm. And they were trolling at like three and a half miles an hour. And they were getting a lot less bites. And so we figured out the spring was messing with the action. So, like, during that first year, one of the captains, he was running 2-2 two, two to 2-5. Two, he was getting a few less bites with the strike assist because of that deadening of the action at that speed. Mm -hmm. But he was landing so many more of them that he still ended up catching more fish. Mm -hmm. um, and so we added a pretensioner so you can basically stretch the spring as far as the spoon would stretch it mm -hmm. so that it's not moving the spring anymore, but it can still extend its strike. Mm -hmm. And so spoons in clear water, you're going to want to pretension it, especially over two and a half miles an hour. But to answer your question, except for that scenario, they're getting more bites and a better landing fish. Mm -hmm. Calvin, is there, uh, we got about three minutes left. Is there something I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about today? Um, no, I guess I'd be curious if Pete, if you want to talk about, I know, I guess used them. And yeah, to summarize, uh, you know, I used them for a, a season and a quarter, I guess, you know, not, not every day, day in and day out, but I, I uh, presented this at our salmon school and uh, towards the end, we had a little new product feature five minute, 10 minute thing there. And, uh, so this was brought up. It raised a lot of eyebrows. Mm -hmm. um, it actually raised a few eyebrows this morning with follow-ups, coincidentally. But in summary, like my my experience was it was uh, all positive. My bite to land ratio was always way up. I saw no failures. I saw no difference in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And to conclude, I'll say I was confident enough to run these every tournament I spoon fished. There you go. Last year. Right out of the gate. Yep. And I saw the results. I kind of hate giving that up. Yeah. But it's the truth. Um, yeah, we, we haven't had any failures. It, yeah. It's way stronger than your line or your drag is going to be. And, and last year, we, we didn't tap into this. Really, it was probably an afterthought. Fishing was really good in general. Mm -hmm. But this year, you know, we're going to we're gonna incorporate these onto our meat rigs. Mm -hmm. Especially our meat rigs where we don't use teasers. And, uh, and this will connect right to the back of, a, of an attractor mm -hmm. with our leader. Mm -hmm. We're excited to see the results with meat fishing, if it really helps the game, again, with meat bites. So. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, too. Like, you know, Pete wasn't running them on his walleye charters, but that makes sense. Like, if, why do an extra step if you're going to get all your fish anyway? Mm -hmm. Or, like, if, if fish are biting really aggressively, they have a high closing speed. It, the benefit of a strike sys is greatly reduced. It's not going to be negative, but it's not going to make as much of a difference. And that's where we would see it in the data. Like even within a given trip, you'd start with the morning bite and the strike sys was helping a little bit, mm -hmm. but then you the bite would shut down. And then there was trips where the only rods taking hits were the strike sys rods and the other rods were dead. The fish are still back there and they're still striking, but the hooks aren't moving towards them mm -hmm. and they don't have any closing speed. So from a captain's perspective, those rods aren't catching anything. They were fishing and fish were trying to eat, most likely. But they just And from a competitive angler, there's you know you hear those stories <sighs> I'd have had one more bite or got got that one fish in, we would have won the tournament. Uh, yeah. That those stories are repeated every Great Lake, every event, right? Yeah. The one more I, th I think that may be resolved. Yeah, it's Plus. I think like the uh, I like that overall average number out of a thousand some fish mm -hmm. of thirty five percent, and you apply that to a ten fish day instead of a thirteen or fourteen fish day. Mm -hmm. Makes a difference. When the bite's tough, you know this is this is really the key to just helping you get that one or two more. Right, and for us, when when the bite's good, like on Lake Erie, mm -hmm. other than the experimental process for ourselves to try these, you know, for our walleye fishery, it's it's a mat it's not a matter of when you. If you're going to catch your limit, it's more like when you're going to probably catch your limit mm -hmm. on most days. So we didn't incorporate these day in and day out because our fisheries were so good. 
these are probably really going to pay off when that bite's a little tougher, maybe for the recreational guys that are trying to get one, two, three more fish in their boat. Mm -hmm. And again, in tournament situations, uh, that's the difference usually between a paycheck and, and a non-paycheck. So that's where I think these are really going to come in and help people and, from what I see. And for someone like me that's not a pro angler, and we might get five bites in a day, and the difference between five fish and three fish is... Mm -hmm a big deal right yeah. um i think the better of a fisherman you are the less you might care about losing a couple fish unless you're fishing a tournament mm -hmm. um and then one thing we didn't talk about was rigging so you can put this on a diver you can put this on board lines you can put it on downriggers um, sliders you just have to make sure all you have after the strike assist is the leader in the bait mm -hmm. you don't want to like to put a snap on weight after the strike says just clip it in yep. front of it because yep. it will mess with the spray. the spray and probably the one last thing chris probably the first question i asked him i said calvin if i have a winning king salmon on a big one will this break will nope. this ever break and your answer was what the, no it's not the weakest thing on a strike assist is the welded ring on the ball bearing swivel so if you've ever had one of those fail when you're fishing then that might happen but I've never had that happen in it. I've tested these and broke them on purpose. Mm -hmm. And they those break at about 40 to 45 pounds. And anyone who's trolling the reels will have a drag force of 22 pounds. And so that's that ring would break at twice the drag capacity your reel has. Well, there you go, Calvin. Appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you, Chris. It's fun to have you. If people want to find out more about Strike Assist, they can go to the website. It is strikeassist.com. Yep. Job. Good to have you. Thank you. All right. Let's bring in our next guest. He's Doug Straub from Fish USA. I see him just hanging out right outside the booth. So bring him in. It's a fun tool. It is. I bought one of those yesterday. UV light? Yeah. Come on in, Doug. Douglas. Douglas. Have a seat. It's been a little while since we've had you on the show. What's happening with you lately? We are cranking away. Yeah. Uh, just, howdy, Pete. Good to see you. Um, no, it's been uh, really good to see everybody again. Um, it's been a terrific crowd this entire weekend. and. Um, it's good to see the enthusiasm. I think people are ready to get out and get fishing with a, you know, lackluster ice season. Everybody hasn't been able to get out fishing lately. And I think this has really sparked um, spring business and everybody's itching to get out there. Yeah. So what, what's that been like for you? I know uh, I've got, I know a bunch of ice retailers in the Midwest and it's been a real, real rough year for them just with everything going on there. Um, but I think they probably feel a lot like you and that there's some, a little bit of sunshine on the back yeah. end with what's going on weather-wise. It's definitely a silver lining, you know, with, with the lack of ice fishing that's gone on this year. It has really sparked a lot of spring business, and um, people are definitely enthusiastic. I would say there's there's more enthusiasm this year than I've seen, certainly in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. of people ready to get out there. Just, But I think part of it just comes down to the, the weather that we've had and it being nice, and uh, it's, it's just good to see. And I think we're going to continue to see a, a really strong spring here, and um get out there on the water and get after them yeah i think it was like almost spring started early except for today yeah right? exactly. yes. then we went back we went back uh, a little bit yeah. with this little event but i think that was the mode like everybody got a spring springs early mode and started that whole process for sure get for sure fancy and buying and looking forward but it's still february Right. Walked out of the hotel this morning like, wow, yeah. this is like real winter out here. The wind was howling through the streets here in Niagara Falls. And uh, it was funny because when you were walking to the to the convention center here, one direction, you just had this massive tailwind. And then you'd turn 90 degrees and you'd be right face into it. So it was, uh, it was fun out there this Absolutely. morning. Absolutely. Would would not be a fun day to have your sales up to your sailboat. That's for sure. So what's what's going on with Fish USA these days? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot happening. Um, you know, we're here at the show, and this is one of our favorite shows to come to, just because it's really in our backyard. It's really the roots of what Fish USA started as as a Great Lakes, um, you know, just carrying Great Lakes tackle. Uh, but now we're really trying to expand into other parts of the country, and that's really our mission. We're spending. We have a crew right now, and 
uh, Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, showing uh, just showing the brand from a branding standpoint out there. And we really just really want to live out the tagline of America's Tackle Shop, and that's our mission right now. Is you know, we're very well known in the Great Lakes, but we still have a lot of work to do nationally, and we're spending a lot of time uh, in other parts of the country. We, we're going to be at the Catfish Conference next week in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're going to be at the Bassmaster Classic here in March, which is our first time ever going to that event. So it's really cool to really just see a different environment, different type of angler, um, and just get to really mesh it all together and and really get to learn how every angler is very different. Uh, Great Lakes fishermen are very different than bass anglers down south, and how the Great Lakes salmon fishermen is very different than the West Coast salmon fishermen. And then putting all that together and learning how it all works, it's it's been really cool to see, and there's a lot of room for growth, and that's our that's our mission. Yeah, a lot of boots on the ground. I mean, a lot of boots on the ground, for sure. And, and you know, we are a digital company, and that's where we spend most of our time and effort. Uh, but I think it's important to really get in front of the customer uh, and be you know part, be there with them, to have that physical presence. I think it's important, and we're really putting a concerted effort into that this year and, and making an effort to be at these shows. Yeah. So Fish USA, America's Tackle Shop, and you're an online company. Um, but there are places, you know, we always want people to go to their local retailer, visit them. But there's a lot of places that just don't have a strong local retailer presence. Um, you guys kind of bring that pro shop to the online customer. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we we, we carry all the big brands, you know, your Shimano's, your Apollo's, your Berkeley's. <laughs> But we also spend a lot of time working with small manufacturers. Um, we have a lot of them. And I think that's really important because at the end of the day, customers really want that. It's not about, you know, just as much money as you can make. Uh, these small uh, manufacturers mean a lot to the industry. Uh, and, and, you know, whether it's you're buying it through a brick and mortar store or buying it online, um, they're just re- really important to us in the, in the entire industry. And, and we we do make a concerted effort to have a lot of niche brands. Um, and we're going to continue expanding on the brands that we have. Be anything for Doug? Tell us about the flagship rod. Yeah. Uh, I know I was kind of part of it. You guys helped, uh, or I, I should say you asked me to help you with the uh, testing the rods. Mm-hmm. Um, you tested a few varieties, you know, before you finalized it. I love them. I think it was a great move. I like the rods a lot. They've been great in my boat. And, uh, so how's that going for you? It's been going really, it's exceeded my expectations. Um, we started uh, with the trolling rods last February. And since then, we've added salmon and steelhead rods. Uh, we've added um, trout rods. We just launched our bass fishing line of rods uh, in January. We've added some new models into the trolling rod lineup, and there's going to be a lot more rods to come. Do you have a telescoping rod too? Yeah, we have two different telescoping models that were just launched about three weeks ago. That's uh, one of the guys I bumped into. I knew was on their way down there to check out telescoping rods, and I said, I didn't even know you had those. <laughs> also, yeah, so yeah, we just launched those about three weeks ago, yeah. and uh, I think those are going to be terrific rods, very versatile rods. Uh, again, targeting a different type of uh, fisherman, uh, smaller boats, um, inline planer boards. You know, most of the rods that we came out initially with were for big boats. Um, so just something different, and uh, we're going to continue to expand on this line, um, and we w- really want the customer to get engaged with them, and really, you know, we're seeing our team over there wearing flagship broad shirts, and that's really a brand within a brand, and we really want to grow this thing uh, and bring value to the to the customer, and that's really the important uh, part with this entire launch is we really wanted to bring value, and when you look at the rods and what you're getting for the for the, the value and what you're paying for them, there's a lot to them. And I'm really proud of our team and the effort that we put into this to be able to get to where we are today. Yeah, I think the price point's very a very good price point for the for the angler, and then uh, I think they're attractive rod. I mean, they're they're good looking rod, so they look great on my boat. At least you know we really like the way they look. And Doug Doug and his team did a great job coming out with those rods, and I think it's good. It's been proving itself, but will continue to prove themselves. Really, they're great rods to try. And if folks out there are looking to support, you know. Um, local company, I should say, local, but you know, local kind of, and uh, support the, the rods that you yeah. introduce. They get a variety for steelhead, for bass guys, for light line, for heavy guy, wire divers, uh, downrigger rods, copper lead core rods. Yeah. So I've had uh, obviously just the ability or chance to check boat rods per se, right? But love them all. Great. So we did a short video here a little while ago. I had to meet over in your booth, and we just did a short video on your 
diver rod, and we've actually had a lot of questions about diver rods this weekend. Can you tell us a little bit about your diver rod? Yeah, so I think the big, the, the thing, the most challenging part of a, uh, a diver rod, specifically wire is, you know, that's a very tough material to deal with, seven strand wire. And that, it's so thin, it's so uh, thin, and it cuts through guides. And, and we, we, it took us, uh, we learned very quickly on our first set of prototypes, and we burned through some guides. Like, man, we got to go back to the drawing board on this one. So we worked with the factory, and, and we came to the real uh, features. It's a, it's a certain insert that we're using. Um, it's a very hard material. It's, it's top of the line. Um, both of those, the guides have really strong, durable feet on them. So when you're fishing, there's no stretch in that line. So it's got to be able to take that impact. Mm -hmm. Um, they're built with a toy tip, which everybody's very familiar with. Uh, so that's really the, and they're great action. You know, you know, we fish, a, we fish a lot. So we know what actions we're looking for. I think we dialed that in and, and just build the components around that. And I think we've done that and, and built a really great rod. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, we had Casey Briscoe on yesterday and, he was talking about uh, some new spoons, and I was just over at the booth here this morning, picked up a couple of those. Tell us about those spoons. Yeah, uh, Casey uh, did a terrific job, and this really came to came to us very quickly. You know, we, we met with Stinger about two weeks ago, and we're like, hey, we got these spoons, and we talked to Casey, and he's like, yeah, let's, let's do them. Let's get them at the show, and they've been terrific. I mean, they've been very, very well received. Uh, we do have a handful left. There's not many left. We did bring a lot. Um, so yeah, terrific job to him and coming up with those designs. I think you really wanted to create some nice brown trout patterns, and I think you did a terrific yeah. job. You're working with him. You're working with guys like Pete Alex. Uh, you've got some guys on Lake Erie. You got guys all over the place. Tell us about some of the people you're working with. And, yeah, and how you go about. So that's one of the cool things is we work with a very diverse group of anglers. And again, going back to our roots of what we are, you know, we've been working with Pete for a very long time. Uh, we work with Rick Hajeki, again, Great Lakes, people that are very well known in this region. But, you know, we just, uh, two years ago, we signed Matt Becker, who just won MLF Angler of the Year last year. So in the bass world, Matt says he's a top 10 angler in the entire world um, on the bass side. We work with Joey Nania. He'll be fishing the Bassmaster Classic very soon. And just super cool diversity in the types of people that we get to work with. We're working with a group on the West Coast called Addicted Fishing. Uh, and just those anglers and, and how they go about just conducting business is just super cool. And uh, it's part of the team. And I think that's one of the attractive things about Fish USA is we worked very hard to put a great product out for our customer. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the team that we work with. And we have a great team of people internally in our extension team, people like Pete. And, uh, and, and these guys always like Doug, Doug would always say, you know, we're always into moving the needle the, mm -hmm. in the right direction. Yeah. So what they did by having a network of, we'll say, we'll just say pro anglers spaced in, in locations from west to east to south to different uh, types of fishing from kayaks to, to bass to steelhead to Great Lakes. And these guys take that information and basically build upon it or it informs them of what the people, what, what I want for a rod or what this guy wants for a rod, what this guy wants for a bass rod. And these guys listen and they build upon that with their team. And they go back and they say, that's what the guys want. Let's, let's, let's build a mousetrap yep. that people want. So they take that data where most companies I know don't do that. Right. You know, we, this it, is what we sell. This is why. And this is it. Take it or leave it. We really do. Take it that extra step. And they use guys like myself to provide that feedback and listen at the end of the day it does come down to the team and i and i view everybody that we work with you know pete's part of our team uh rick is a part of our team and that's what we're really trying to build upon um and it's the same thing of the customer base so we have a very loyal customers that you know they shop with us religiously and we enjoy that we want them to feel that and, and feel as if we're providing a great service to them and they feel part of what we do we, we love that and we want to continue to to live out that mission and really become again Merrick Stockle Shop. You guys been working for quite a while with Stealth Core. If people don't know about Stealth Core, can you give us a little overview on that. Why don't you give a little history first? I'll let you go ahead. This is really your baby, your brainchild. Stealth Core, Stealth Core. Uh, you know, it bothered me fishing lead core. I fish a lot of lead core, really, and uh, it's probably one of the first guys to really bring it to Lake Erie from from Lake Ontario. I saw how effective it was in getting your baits down deep. And in Erie, we were old school doing different things back then. We we're adding weights and all kinds of different stuff to uh, obtain depth. 
But when Lightcore first came out and hit kind of Lake Ontario first, tapped into it up there because they got it, so I got to have it. Every tool that catches fish, and you got it, and I don't, you got the edge. So it's all about making sure my edges are equal to your edges. So lead core started, and then uh, so I kind of brought that whole lead core thing back to Lake Erie to chase these walleyes when they when they went deep. Okay, very effective. And so what bothered me the most was putting the traditional lead cores in the water with yellow, bright yellow, white, bright blue, red, black gray intentionally they color line every 30 feet intentionally so the anglers can count 30 every 30 feet it changes 30 feet of blue that means 30 here's yellow now i got 60 feet out but we're fishing tough conditions calm lakes semi-clear water high sun and we're dumping i run four to five sides or four or five rods per side of my planet boat program i'm dumping lots of this bright stuff in the water and i got fluorocarbon leaders on the end of it you know right never sat well with me so at the time i was selling some tackle and i had a, a connection with a lead corp company so i asked them i said can we reroute these colors get rid of eight out of ten can we just go black and red black is still probably the most stealthiest color color people use in the great lakes right black dipsies black weights black everything and then red had had the tendency to dissipate the quickest as it descends in the water so I asked them, can we do an alternating black and red lead core, 18 pounds for walleye, 27 for, for salmon fishing and trout? And they said, sure. So they developed it. It came out. It had a few tweaks, some issues with some bleeding and some other stuff, you know, like anything else. Mm -hmm. Go back to the drawing table, correct it. And so that really spawned the stealth core. And I named it stealth core because that was the intentional to be stealthy. And it's obviously lead core. So at some point, the Fish USA approached me, and they basically asked to, we'll say, buy that, buy that name or buy the technology, and we we basically sat down and worked the deal out, and it's their baby now, and, and they've uh, advanced in since yeah. that actually improved it even more. Yeah, there's been a few tweaks to it over the years, really not a whole lot, um, but it's a great product, um, and it's been very successful for us, and. I'm super excited about the future with, with that line. I think there will be some modifications to it uh, in the future, uh, which will be exciting and we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a terrific product. And uh, if you haven't tried it, definitely check it out. Yeah, I do. What's, uh, we got a few minutes left here. What's kind of on the horizon for you guys? What are you, what are you working on for this group? So the, what we have coming from a, from a branded product standpoint, we do have some nets coming. Um, I'm really, really, really excited about these. Me nets. too. <laughs> really, really excited about these nets. I think the net, uh, I'd say market has been pretty stale for a very long time. Uh, so I, we got some nets that will be coming out. I think Great Lakes anglers will be very, very happy with them. A um, little bit of a change of pace. So really excited about that. There'll be several more products that are coming. Stuff that we're currently working on and developing are two to three years out still. Yeah. Um, but really excited about it. But the nets in the short term are going to be the, the most exciting thing that we have coming. Very cool. Any uh, good trips are coming up for you this year? Where are you going? For? Oh man, I don't know. Uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be getting out. You going to King of the Lake with me this year? We can go as King Will. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. We didn't even talk about this, but we're, we're in. in. End, of, end of April. Yeah, I'm in. Right. Absolutely. Uh, no, uh, we'll definitely be visiting ICAST this year. We'll probably do some fishing when we're down in Florida. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there'll be several things popping up. Very good. Hey, man. Thanks Appreciate you stopping by and seeing us. Good, you, good, to, good to see you. Good to have you on the show again. Thank you. Rod Straub from Fish right. USA. And our next guest, I see, is just hanging out right here in front of the booth, and we'll bring him in in a second. But, again, if you want to get into that drawing, go ahead and put Captain Pete, hashtag Captain Pete in there. Uh, we got 22 entries so far. I'll see you guys. Go ahead and drop those comments in to jump in. Nick, how you doing? How's it going, you guys? Just living the dream, Eight. buddy. We're Chris, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Day four here at the Greater Niagara Fishing Expo, and you know, are these mine? <laughs> you brought. You can take. Did you bring these for me? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Anytime. I just met Nick really for the first time this weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, 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 we've had a good time. Times really, and uh, we're on the same page, like on a lot of things. Yeah, we've discovered so. Yeah. Hard workers, peers. <laughs> hard workers, guys that have their fingers in probably too many things. Yeah, but it's a U.S. of A. and you can get what you get that you, the work you put into it. And he's one of those guys that 
Yeah. I appreciate his work ethics, which which was the topic, the discussion. Yeah. He's got more than one thing going on, and <laughs> I can appreciate his uh, where he's going as a young guy. So. So what's funny is, is I went down to the hotel lounge last night. I was in my room, went down to get some coffee, and I go down there, and there's Casey Prisco and Rob Westcott hanging out down there, and they're like, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, it's kind of getting ready for tomorrow. I got a couple openings still for tomorrow, and they're like, we got just the guy for you. <laughs> they're like, I'm going to call Nick right now. And he gets off the phone, and Casey basically said the exact same thing that Pete said. Is it? You know, Nick's a real good young guy. He's got his hands on a lot of stuff, just a hard worker and a guy that's just – out there doing his thing so yeah that, that people, means a lot a lot of people are thinking a lot of good things about you man awesome awesome yeah you know i uh, raised raised right my my parents always taught me like work hard for what you want in life and uh and treat everybody equal um no matter where people come all walks of life you know they're they're family to me and you know when we come to these shows it's just it's great meeting new new people new anglers all all across the country yeah your company is soco baits tell us a little bit about that yeah, so Soko Baits, uh, we started a company now seven years ago, and we were more of a, a panfish company. Um, it started actually with my father. Uh, it was more of a hobby, mm-hmm. and friends started getting on board saying, like, oh, you guys are making baits, and, and then it turned into a business format, and uh, here we are today uh, in the salmon industry now and now in the panfish and going to be getting into the walleye market this next year. Mm-hmm. Well, you brought some stuff with you. Let's see what you got. Here. Yeah, so this is our uh, this is our prime cut. This is our soft plastic. Uh, uh, we call it a meat body spoon. Um, this product came about. We were sitting uh, we we're sitting at our desk. It was the middle of winter. Uh, now we're going in the fourth year, and I'm like, all right, we got to come up with a salmon product. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are the two top selling things that guys love to use? I'm like spoons and meat. I was like, let's make a meat body spoon. And I uh, took some metal in the shop and put some tape on it, poured some plastic, made a cutout, and uh, we brought it to our designer and out popped the prime cut. That's interesting. How do you how do you fish this thing? Uh, so the prime cut can be fished in all types of meat heads. Uh, pretty much every meat head in the industry, uh, um, you can run this bait head in. Uh, the nice thing, um, actually Casey had a lot to do with this product as well with the, uh, the tab size. Because when he came to me, he said, Nick, we got to have a good solid tab, which would be the spine of the bait. So to, to hold up to short king strikes and uh, to be working when you get those strikes. Um, so when we're running like our coppers, uh, we set a 500 copper out. A lot of times, if we were running like traditional meat, we take a hit, we got to pull that copper in, check the, check the rig, make sure it's running good, make sure the bait's running smooth. The way the prime cut's designed, we use a thicker tab, big body tab to where when you take a short strike, most of the time we'll reclip it, let it sit there, five to ten minutes later, boom, we get a secondary follow-up hit. And that's the one that usually gets gets pinned real good. So do you have one named after Casey yet? Yes. What's so that? Casey actually has two named, uh, and they are actually both sold out at the show. Yeah. Um, we Imagine have the Frisco that. Destroyer, and we also have the Dirty Goose. Um, the Dirty Goose is... Um, a black base with a UV tab and a and a fish eye on the back end, and the Prisco Destroyer is a silver base tab with a UV green dots going down it. I should have known. Yeah, <laughs> probably could have guessed. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I told him I was like, send me over some patterns, and those are the patterns. So I was like, all right, let's we're gonna run them, and uh, you know they they catch fish uh, from here all the way out. Guys run them in Michigan uh, and all the Great Lakes, having great success on them. Well, I have uh, an affinity for pan fish. There's something about catching the biggest small fish in the lake. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you become a pan fish guy and then get it into trout and salmon? So. The trout and salmon, uh, I got I, I got into drift boat fishing on, on Salmon Oswego River. I had a boat built out in Idaho for the Oswego River. And that's kind of what got me into the salmon industry in, in Lake Ontario. Uh, one day I, I took my uh, my drift boat out and I was right in with the big boats. Out mm-hmm. about two miles, I started off with two dipsy rods on mounts that I probably had duct taped to the side of the boat. <laughs> right. And I... Uh, we went out and I, you know, I caught, I caught a big king out on my own. And from, from then on, I was like addicted. It, it started just on that one trip, heading out with the big boats in my small boat. And, uh, now I run a, a Crestliner 2250 authority and, uh, I do about 
roughly 25 to 30 trips on Ontario each season and a lot of uh, walleye fishing and uh, Finger Lakes fishing now. So that's what kind of got me into the market of the salmon industry. And then this kind of meant to be. Yeah, that's how I look at it. Tell me about that. Uh, Cat Nick Sokolowski, what, what is your charter called? Uh, my charter is Soko Outdoor Sport Fishing. Um, I'm based on Oneida Lake, uh, so I do a lot of walleye and perch on Oneida. But I also travel to uh, Oswego Harbor. That's that's my home port that I go out of. Um, and in the springtime, I'm uh, pretty much on Cayuga Lake, jig fishing lake trout and uh, running uh, for browns and rainbows out there. As so, well. is, it, is it true that you uh, turned Captain Casey on to those lake trout, Cayuga? Yes. Yeah. You, you did. Huh? And I, and I, you know, you I, can't take credit for that. I'll give him some credit on the rigs he runs and how he fishes. You know, I, I learn a lot from him as well. I'm still scared of him, I think. Yes. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. He's holding back. Right. But I will say, Casey came out with me uh, last last year, actually. Uh, it was the first, I think it was March 10th or March 11th. I call him up. I was like, hey, I was like, we got a little break in weather. I was like, you want to go out and try jigging some lake? Because he's like, I'll go. It only lasts about 45 minutes, and then eggs and bacon and hot coffee sounded way better in uh, a five five degree wind chill. So, uh, but he got hooked on it then, and uh, he helped me out. He had a couple of groups last season uh, that he brought down uh, to fish on my boat. Um, and, and Casey, he's always been just he's always been up front with me, helping me out, and uh, you know any anything I've needed. Uh, He's he's been there to help me out. So you guys are he, he's been jigging those Lakers out already, right? This month. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah we like we started on uh, month, right? February fourth. Is that uh, common to be no, out this early? No. Uh, okay. The past four seasons, I think March eleventh to yeah. March fifteenth was our lake, right? yeah yeah it was our earliest. But I mean, you get sixty degree temps in early February. And it's impressive to go lake trout fishing. They said he was getting them one eighty six down. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, pulling them. And I was just out actually before I got to the show. Fun actually, and, and you story. know, and I get a lot of guys uh, that that ask about like the lake trout. I'm like, you got to do, it. and they're like, nah, we troll them on Lake Ontario. They're just like. They're kind of by catch for us. I'm like, you haven't jigged them on a medium light rod and like walleye gear. Basically, uh, we're using 10 pound test, 12 pound leader. I mean, seven foot rods and you're fishing 180 foot on a 10 pound lake trout. Yeah. They're overpowering you every time. They are, they're, they're fun to catch <laughs> that way. I've, I've tangled with them myself, you know, like yeah. spinning gear yep. and they're like, you know, I mean, they are, they are, they pull. I mean, there's, it's a great fight. In, in Cayuga Lake is a phenomenal fishery. Uh, the, the fishing is, I would say, out of all the Finger Lakes, by far the best, uh, especially the size and quality of the fish uh, that are out there. And we and we see it's not uncommon in the springtime, April, I call it the, the hot zone, um, to get 80, 90 bites in the morning uh, with, with, with guys on the boat. I um, mean, that's triples, quads. I mean, it's it's a blast. And sore, sore arms by the end of those trips. That's and that's something, thing. you know, you guys have this Lake Ontario fishery that's really diverse, but in our neck of the woods and Lake Superior, going out and vertical jigging lake trout is like, it's yeah, it's, a, it's something that they do a lot out there. Right, and right. it's something that's pretty commonplace. You know, they're not going to go out and, and do a Wilson Harbor type of trip where you're going to go out and yep. hang a whole bunch of salmon. Like, it's a yeah. lake trout fishery. We do have the salmon are, are getting better out there, but... It's a lake trout fishery, and yeah. a lot of guys will go out and do it the way you're talking about because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And if people are really, you know, want to see what this is about, Casey did some lives. So just go Dirty Goose Sport Fishing Facebook page. He did some Facebook yeah. lives and showed his electronics, and that's the cool thing. You know, you're it's, dropping down. It looks a lot like ice fishing. Yeah. It is. You're dropping that jig down, and you just see those marks come up. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 that's the, and that's the thing as I uh, – like Casey and myself, like watching those units, like we're trying to figure out whose line is who. Cause when you're down 180 feet and you got four anglers with, with jigs on, right. there's times where you have so many fish on the screen. You just tell everybody just burn them to the surface. It's like, cause I have no clue where everybody is. So yeah. you got to really be on your electronics knowing, okay, Pete, you got to stop reeling. All right, Chris, Start reeling a little bit. All right, Chris, you got a fish coming up for you. So it's it's a lot of sticking with a unit. Um, and uh, you can do it without a unit. I mean, there's a lot of fish. It's fishing blind, like guys that don't have the units to to read down that deep like with their jigs. It's not impossible. Um, it's just easier. It, yeah, makes it, easier, right? makes it a lot easier having a having a unit.
You're using big stuff. Tell me about uh, the, the jigs you're using. For you. uh, yeah, so the jigs, uh, we're using a one-ounce ball head, um, a uh, five-out hook, uh, nice stout hook, because these Lakers, they... When they get on, but when they get them up in their in their jawbone and stuff, they pry out some some chintzy hooks. So you definitely want to have a good solid jig uh, with them pulling on it, um, and pairing that up with a four to five inch swim bait. Uh, I would say on Cayuga Lake, top colors chartreuse white, um, sunny days black and purples are are really hot. Um, and the bait forage out there is more of a the the alewives like saw bellies and stuff. So silver based fish, but you know, Lakers with, with collars and stuff. They they like the pinks and whites and stuff. Shark yep, yep, but, but naturals are also really, really hot when we were around the bait balls. Lake Superior, it's all white. Yeah. All right. White. All white. Yeah, everybody's, yeah. everybody's using white out there. Yeah, and we usually start off, if I got four guys in the boat, I'll have a different color in each each hand. Because uh, mm -hmm. some days, you know, they're just doing the opposite of what they would typically do uh, um, on a sunny day. To where sunny days, the black and purples out on Cayuga just seem to seem to kill it uh throughout the morning but uh you know some days they just want white you know, like just like your guys like fishery out there yeah so you're on the east east end down there uh tell me about your walleye fishing down in those lakes as well and we have pete on and we have a lot of these other guys coming in talking lake erie walleye so how, how are you yeah so are? myself i uh, i mainly target walleyes on oneida um i i haven't really got into the lake ontario like Shimo, henderson harbor up north in the eastern basin yet uh this year i'm gonna definitely put a little more time in up there uh, i do more ice fishing on Shimo and henderson than i do open water fishing um so i would say oneida is like the key lake that i always target and that's a, a shallow fishery um we're pretty much average 20 to 30 foot depths on oneida lake uh jigging with uh blade baits like half ounce blades uh casting swim baits like kite tech swim baits uh in the spring and fall and then and then it's a great trolling bite in the summer months as well how do you troll with them inline boards mostly oh uh, yeah you got guys that are trolling inline boards uh and then I, I'm a huge bottom bounce fisherman, so we're uh, we're running typically two to three ounce bottom bouncers with about a four foot leader with our worm harness rigs. Um, the fishery the past couple of years uh, has been amazing just because I think of the, the bad ice seasons we've been having. Yeah. Um, guys can't get out to these spots to hammer on these walleyes for two months straight. Um, we went out on Oneida. I live on the South Shore. I've only I only made it out twice this year on Oneida. In both times, we have phenomenal walleye fishing. But then we couldn't get back out there. It's just the ice, 50 degrees rolled in, and, and we had to stay off. So 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 what's a big walleye on Oneida, and what's an average walleye on Oneida? A big walleye on Oneida, you're going to be in the 24 to 25 inch range. Okay. Um, pushing that five pounds, uh, four and a half five pound uh, fish. Average, you're going to see 17 to 19 inch. Um, we have a we have a big class of young like pin walleyes uh, in the deeper section on the east end. Um, in the western uh, basin of Oneida, we, we find better quality fish that 18 to 22 inches uh, in the grass uh, or off those first ledges leading towards the east end. Got a question coming in here from Scott Garbs. I think he's referring to uh, the Laker jig. He says, "Do you use stinger hooks?" With your jig heads. Uh, so I don't use stinger hooks. Um, I feel uh, with the way these lake trout are hitting on the jig up, they're definitely wanting to swallow the baits at times. And we try to preserve the fishery that we have. So I would rather lose a lake trout on a jig with a single hook than have a stinger hook buried in the throat yep. or in the gill plate. Mm -hmm. So that's the only reason why uh, I don't use stinger hooks. And when the fishing, like springtime, you're, you're getting so many bites throughout the morning. It's like if you lose a fish or if you lose 10 fish, you're going to hook up on another 20. So so that's why I stick with just a single hook uh, presentation uh, just to preserve these old dinosaur fish that we have and, and not getting those extra hooks in the gills. Yeah. When you've got that bite going, too, it's like. The more time you spend fiddling and trying to get those hooks out of the mouth, the yeah. time you can't spend fishing. So. And I will say, when we're jig when we're jigging these fish and a client will hook up on a fish, they're reeling them for a couple minutes, they're getting them up, and then it falls off. And they're like, oh, and like they're kind of hemming and hawing. I'm like, keep reeling. A lot of the times, those fish will come back and hit that jig another three or four times, and you will hook them again. Uh, oh. So when they're jigging up, they'll boom, oh, I just got bit. Yeah, and like They'll start to drop their baits. like... 
keep burning it away from them. They're, and we've had fish come up. Do they follow? Will, they follow, will, 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 will a hook fish be followed by multiple? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So you always have to be ready for that follow-up fish. And, uh, and I've had single fish come from bottom of the lake up to 220 feet uh, to the surface and swipe the bait, pulling it out of the water. So wow. it was a, uh, that fish came up and that was that client. I, I remember that too. The fish disappeared on the unit because it only marks so far under the boat. And I was like, keep reeling. And he reels as he pulls the swim bait out, boosh, this big boil hits on the side of the boat. So I was like, that shows right there. The fish came up 220 feet to hit that bait wow. and, and he didn't get it, but it was still amazing to see that fish do that. Good stuff. Absolutely. And these are the other thing I would say is, you know, we're out salmon fishing. You got a big mature salmon. It's three years old. Yeah. These, these Lakers, I mean, that you're fishing these lakes. Yeah, they're 10, 15, 20 years yeah. old. So it takes a while to get a, a lake trout to a, a good size that you're going to want to take a picture with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and Cayuga definitely has that fishery. Um, I would say the average fish we get is that six to eight pound range, but we do get plenty of 10 to 12 pounders throughout the springtime. And, you know, it's it's nice to see those those averages as well. So you brought these prime cuts to, to show off here today. What else do you have in your product line? We got about uh, three minutes here. So also, I hear some other things. Even. Yeah. So what else we got is uh, our new bump boards. Uh, we have a thir a 24, a 32 inch bump board, and a 48 inch bump board. Um, we came out with the 48 for the Great Lakes guys because we had the 32s for kind of the walleye industry, mm -hmm. and then the lake trout, the salmon guys, and the muskies and northern pike guys were like, "When are you gonna come out with a bigger board?" So now we have the 48 available at the show and also online. Uh, and then our panfish line of products, we have uh, our crazy eyes. So a lot of people know uh, the crazy eyes that are into pan fishing. We've, I don't know how many eyes we've manufactured in the past couple of years, but it's it's been a lot. And uh, you know, it's always uh, it's always funny guys saying like, I always used to take perch eyes out and fish with them, and now they just use a soft plastic or uh, synthetic perch eyes. So that's uh, that's the other products that we have at the show. Uh, so. And next year we'll have uh, definitely some more walleye gear. Uh, who, who came up with the crazy eye idea? I was not originated. I would give that uh, with me and my dad. Just you know, we put our minds together and we try to figure out uh, the next bait on the product line because uh, we're I would put us as like innovators. We want to we want to make something that's different in the market. Um, and that I think came about. I'll give my dad credit on the crazy eye because he was he was shooting plastics one night. And I think a glob of soft plastic landed on the table and it kind of formed that ball shell. So I was like, I looked at him like, if we get some epoxy in this, I was like, it'll look like a perch eye. So yeah, good idea. Went, got in the shop and started to uh, become a mad scientist <laughs> per se. And that's uh, how it all started. Yeah. Man. And then, uh, and then here, here we go. We got a synthetic perch eye. That's uh, <laughs> that's we, we do well with throughout the spring, like fall and into the winter time as well with that. So, and then, I, I know that's a, that's a thing that's pretty big around this neck of the woods too. Is the perch fishing? Yeah. Uh, is that something you do as well? Yes. Yeah, I do uh, springtime perch on Cayuga Lake, and then fall on Oneida Lake. Uh, the fall perch fishery on Oneida uh, is is another phenomenal bite. Um, our perch population the past two or three years has exploded. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's uh, just from like the gobies entering the system and just uh the amount of grass we have in our system now but we've noticed the average size perch in oneida has gone up and uh the walleyes are growing off of that average are going up because we got a lot of baby perch coming up and comers that they're feeding on so we got a great great fishery on oneida and and i i can't see it going away anytime soon uh okay. from what i see each each uh spring and fall yeah, it's uh, you know, it's something in our neck of the woods in Minnesota. People are really excited about. It. Everybody talks they want to go out and catch jumbo perch. And, yeah. And I see the pictures that Craig Sleeman puts up on his oh, yeah. Instagram, and you're like, now those are jumbo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Oneida, we we average, uh, I would say nine to eleven inches on Oneida, but you do get the occasional fourteen and a quarter, and some guys get a fifteen, but you always get those guys at the dock saying they. Yeah had a pail full of 15s and i have yet to catch a 15 on oneida and i'm out there pretty much every day in the fall so uh, uh not saying it can't be possible but 
it's hard to hard to believe that when they say they got a full bucket of 15 inches. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just, a fish story. Just a couple of them. Would be yeah, you, yeah. Just you say one, and that's like if you see a 15 inch perch. I mean, that's it's impressive. That's an impressive perch. Like like when I caught 14, I was like, what is this thing? Like it's a giant. So, uh, but we get some big ones on Cayuga as well. That's that's got the, I would say, uh, bigger population of like big perch, but uh, it doesn't have. I would say nearly the number is what Oneida has on the north end. Awesome. So, Nick, really appreciate you coming. Yeah, thanks for having you here. Good luck Dave, on uh, talking to you. Luck, yeah, good luck with the future and everything you got going on. Keep up the hard work. Thank you. I will uh, see you out at Wilson here in a couple well, months. Looking forward to it. Yep. Right. These guys keep telling me to come out, so I'm coming out this spring. Keep going. <laughs> All right. For more information on this okay. product line, you go to SoCoBaits.com mm-hmm. and see if our next guest, I saw her walking around over there. Oh, there she is. Stacy, we're ready for you. Again, if you want to jump into that uh, drawing, you can go ahead and put in hashtag Captain Pete into the comments, and I'll get you in the drawing for the Fish Hawk Electronics swag package. And uh, we're going to be talking a little lake trout here again. We've been talking lake trout with Nick, and uh, we're going to be talking to a scientist about some about some lake trout. This is an interview that I've been looking forward to all weekend. Stacy, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, Stacy, just tell our audience who've never had you on before. A little bit about yourself. You've got it. Um, you can't use this. Oh, oh, you can't we use this. No, it's we got, we got, we got, this is a total wing fest. <laughs> Trevor, do we do, we do has, any, has anybody ever brought us? Yeah. 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 I'll let it, I'll let it I'm, go. I'm Pete Alex all night. Stacy for a Gold Creek right. Lake he's, Fishery I, Specialist. He's the guy City. calling the shots. If he's good yeah. with it, then, uh, you know, Chris, uh, whatever. I mean, yeah. My handwriting is so bad, it's mostly incipherable. Right. So. Well, we loosened her up a little. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm a bit of a chit chatter, so without my talking points, I might stray from the topic. Well, that's what this is all about. Do you need to do it, or can I leave? <laughs> I think you know, I think you're you, right. Oh, no, I'll stick around. So. You're going for Lake Trout. Huh? I love Lake Trout. Okay, good. I am really That's what I thought you were looking forward to this, this one. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to them all, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to be. Tell me. Go ahead. All right. All right. We'll Some of my partners were very jealous that they could not be here because they're big fans of the yeah. show. Well, well, we can we can fix that. <laughs> we do lots of online uh, interviews too, so. I uh, love to have you guys on the show. It's fun. You know, I love having guys like Pete on to talk about fishing, but I really enjoy having the scientists on every once in a while too, and, and just getting an, a different perspective. Absolutely, yeah. So, tell us about what you're working on. Now, you did some seminars this weekend on lake trout uh, <laughs> tagging and tracking. Tell us yes. About that. So there's a project going on right now, uh, tagging and tracking uh, lake trout in Lake Ontario. Mm-hmm. So uh, it just kickstarted uh, spring of 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, little backstory for your listeners who might not be familiar with uh, Great Lakes uh, lake trout. Um, there's been restoration efforts going on for upwards of 50 plus years. So trying to bring back lake trout um, after they were extirpated for a whole gamut of reasons. But um, so trying to bring back that population. We've succeeded in a lot of ways. When we stock these fish, they live to be adults, they grow big, but the problem is that they're not reproducing in any great number. So they, they, they're not creating a population that's self-sustaining right now. So this project is trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah. So what are you doing to do that? So we are um, tagging these lake trout with uh, acoustic tags. So it's these... The, the concept is very simple. Uh, you know, you pop a tag in a fish, you can track how it moves around the lake. But uh, these tags are fancy and uh, really, really cool. So the um, scientists perform a small surgery and implant the tag right in the lake trout's stomach. Uh, these surgeries are super quick, happen in under two minutes, right out on the water. Um, the tag itself is um, communicating a unique little um, number uh, sequence 
that identifies that fish as that particular fish. Mm -hmm. And Lake Ontario right now is lit up with receivers on the lake bottom. These receivers are listening devices. So they're out there in the deep listening for the siren song of lake trout chirping. And when they hear those individual lake trout, they can record a timestamp and they record the location. Okay. So from that, we, as part of this project, are hoping to figure out uh, spawning locations. So we know we have a lot of historical records about where lake trout are spawning, but as I mentioned, this is a totally different variety of lake trout because we don't have the Lake Ontario strain lake trout anymore. So we need to know in real time, where are these fish going? So with this huge acoustic receiver array, they call it, with all these different listening devices down on the lake bottom, we can figure out where our lake trout in Lake Ontario are going in the fall to spawn. And from there, we'll be able to kind of hone in on some of the characteristics. What are they choosing for their locations? Like what makes it a good spot that the lake trout like? Is it something about um, the substrate, um, the, the fetch? Um, so there's a whole bunch of different variables that we want to dig into. But we know that habitat is likely a key issue in why our lake trout aren't able to reproduce effectively. So is this part of the GLATOS? Yes, right? yes, yeah, part Chris, of the GLATOS with network. Chris, Chris V, I call him? Uh, yeah, he's kind of like the man behind the computer. Right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm familiar with that from Lake Erie. Yeah. talked to Chris before and uh, tapped him. He sent me some uh, PowerPoint on the Lake Erie movements. Yep, yep, uh, so same, in and out, in and out for, same concept. With all the receivers and the whole glad, it's the glad those things. So yeah, very familiar with it. It's kind of neat. It's a neat project. And it's really cool because it just leverages the power of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So like these bits of technology, we know they can it can get expensive fast. So different agencies, this is US, Canadian, academics, they're all maintaining different parts of the array, different receivers. So together we can really get a good picture that would have otherwise not been possible. So these receivers are constantly receiving this information. Now, for you to collect that, do you have to go and pull the receiver out, or can you just drive over and kind of? No. So um, you you need to physically collect the receivers. Okay. There's so, a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot. So it's a huge it, effort. That's uh, is it November, early December when they get pulled? Uh, it depends on the agency. Okay. But there's yeah, a lot. so yeah. Have you ever seen the the network of these? I've, like I've seen them every year. Yeah. 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 There's a lot. Yeah. So if you go to the GLaDOS website, you can look at the project maps and mm -hmm. it'll just show you the uh, the receiver array for Lake Ontario. It's incredible. It's like fully covered. Mm -hmm. I, and I believe they, they basically drive over top of them and they hit the, basically the release button and they come up. So like some that. of them have a release and some of them uh, they actually grapple for with like a big old grappling hook to pull. Yeah, yeah. So um, depending on the locations, um, some of the in-river locations, like folks that are working in the Niagara River have a harder time of things because the flow they're dealing with. Um, some of them have to be retrieved by divers. Mm -hmm. which, which agency actually goes and retrieves those? Um, all different agencies. Okay. So, um, New York State DEC, U.S. Geological Survey, the Fish and Wildlife Service, DFO. Because there's a lot. So that's why I asked you. There's so yeah. many of these, and they're all over. So yeah, exactly. Maybe there's more so than one the, boat going around. The there. power of teamwork gets it done. <laughs> So how, how do you go about uh, getting the fish to, to put these in? Well, so this was a really fun uh, part of the project. So they used a whole suite of different gears. They bottom trawled to collect lake trout. They set gill nets. And my personal favorite was contracting uh, charter captains to hook and line angle for them. So our mutual friend was involved with three or four of those missions this year out of Wilson, Wilson area. Yes, was that Captain uh, Casey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually was down there when I saw you guys leaving on probably three of those voyages. But I understand he, you guys had a couple rough trips out there catching them. Um, out of Wilson, possibly. Yeah. So I wasn't on the boat those days. I think the migration mm -hmm. kind of started early. Yeah, they, yeah. They weren't as prevalent as they, if it was like two or three weeks earlier. But, um, out of the East End, when I was aboard, we were working out of uh, Mexico Bay. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a match made in heaven being able to hook and line catch them. Because the fish were out really deep. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're catching them, you were able to regulate how quickly you're bringing them in. 
the number of lake trout that you had on the deck to perform the surgeries. And, uh, you know, it's, it's their job to catch fish and they're really yeah. good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how many do you feel are in the great or in Lake Ontario swimming? I know that the transmitters, you don't know if the fish was caught or it died, right? So, so how many they, active ones. Are, so they put in a, a 300 and, um, 20 tags so far and another 150 are going in this spring yeah so um they're actually able to based on how the tag is communicating you can kind of see which ones are dead because the tag will just be stuck in one spot yeah um and we had three folks um call in a tag so we had a one percent return rate um from people are, catching the tag are they fish. the bright tag are they bright orange, I should say? So these, uh, the the tag that is, uh, the acoustic tag is an internal tag right. in their the belly. The transmitter. Part. Yes. And then all the fish were marked with an external and orange tag. Orange ones, right? Yep. That's yeah. called a Floyd tag. Um, those aren't going to be retained for the whole project. The, the fish will shed that eventually. But oh. for now, um, these are 10-year tags. So because the lake trout live so long, um, we're going to be able to collect some really interesting data from these. So if you do harvest a fish... A tagged fish there's a number on it where you can call and report it and return the tag and scientists are really interested to know um catch rates we, we had a guest on i think it was yesterday that caught a tagged fish <laughs> and they're like we caught it exactly where it was tagged it was a month later so so i'm gonna i'm gonna pick mr special guest three over here okay trevor is, is sitting it, in the background here. trevor is any of this ringing a bell yeah what happened which on the tag yes that was on your boat so he was doing a camera shoot on yeah. my boat three probably five five years ago yeah. yeah and one of the lake trout we caught had one of those oh, it was dang. a transmitter fish yeah and it had the, the, the big orange one which i knew all about this right yeah. but you call it in yeah okay but, but we caught one while he was doing a shoot on my phone like you're here. Oh, that's Which great. Pretty, pretty nice. And yeah. <laughs> and to be able to share with the uh, viewers. Pretty neat. Yeah. We took a lot of pictures of it. <laughs> so what have you learned so far? It's a pretty new study here, but uh, what have you learned so far? Well, we haven't learned anything so Nothing. far. Yep, you sound so, like kids. Well, I always I mean, ask them, what did you learn in school today? Nothing. The potential is <laughs> infinite right now. Um, so it was interesting, though, um, while they were out there um, catching the, the trout that they were going to put tags in, they did encounter more uh, presumed wild fish than we anticipated. So um, I think it was upwards of... 25 um, presumed wild. So that's based on the fact they don't have that metal coated wire tag. They don't have any fin clips and they don't have any kind of like telltale signs of a fish that was in a hatchery like that fin erosion kind of beat up snout. So uh, we did manage to tag a fair number of presumed wild fish. So we'll be able to make some kind of like uh, off the cuff comparisons of how hatchery fish are behaving and how these presumed wild fish are behaving. We also collected genetics information mm -hmm. that we can get, um, you know, the strain and the sex of the fish. So we'll be able to see if the males and females are behaving differently or different strains. That was something that, you know, I think we, we had Steve Hurst on yesterday and Steve was talking about the DNA project that the New York DUC is doing on, on salmon right now. Yeah, yeah. So is that, you know, the technology of that and, when we think of DNA, we think of like you know, solving murders and things like that. Uh, how has that DNA technology come to the point now where we can just use it on fish? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's some incredible advances. And the fact that um, some of the, the cost has really come down on a lot of these things and has made it more accessible to use. When you're talking, you need a sample size of hundreds and hundreds of fish to be able to like really... Um, decisively answer your question. Uh, and there's some cool lake trout genetics projects going on too um, that are like next level. You might have to invite the geneticist on to to dig into it. But uh, yeah, folks, folks are looking at it. Um, not necessarily the parentage based um, tagging that Steve was talking about. So one of the other, I was talking to Jay Wesley from Michigan a couple years, a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me, so they're bringing the Arctic grayling back to Michigan, and some of the things that they've been doing, they've been just trying to plant these fish and haven't been very successful. So what they've done now is they're growing the fish in hatcheries, but instead of planting fingerlings, 
they're just planting eggs. And they're seeing that in the western states as being very successful. So they're trying that this year in Michigan. Is Ooh. that something that you think that you'd look at it in New York? Is it, instead of going out and, and dropping the fingerlings in, they're just dropping eggs. I think probably not, just because the habitat is what we're thinking is so bad right now. Um, so some uh, kind of preliminary uh, camera work and some analyses looking at the substrate, the bottom of the lake. Um, some of these historic spawning areas where it used to be that pristine cobble where the eggs could like plinko down and rest safely from egg predators. They'd get all the sediment brushed off them. All of those are filled in now with sediment, with dracaenid mussels, the zebra and quagga mussel shells. So really, if you were to try to seed those areas with eggs, they're just they're just not going to make it, probably. Has there ever been a discussion on the same program with Team Salmon? Uh, oh, oh, well, there's Tra probably there. Some folks have have done tracking with Chinook salmon, but not to this scale. No, 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 no. Uh, I think there were a few like experimental like satellite tanks, but not like a large scale project like this. We need if they did. Yeah, yeah the potential is there. And really with needed. having uh, an array out like this, it's not project specific. So tag lake trout are working with those receivers, tag lake sturgeon, walleye. So there's a whole bunch of different projects going on. You're, you're doing how many next year or this year? Uh, so this year it's going to be 150-ish tags. Think we can split the difference and get 75 kings tag? Yeah, I'm not the one to talk to. It would be, it'd be very, I mean, obviously, this is a king salmon driven lake, really. I mean, I granted uh, lake trout are, let's say, they're, they're a protected species. Well, yeah, because our goal is restoration, restoration here. Restoration. Yeah. We need to see the, the tracking. We need to track king salmon, see what they did throughout the lake, back and forth across the shores, you know, east, west, you know, the whole thing. Where they winter, and, things like and that. It's cool be because um, some of the tags that we used in these tagged lake trout, they actually have pressure sensors in them so that you can see in the water column where the fish are moving as well. It wasn't all the tags. It was just a smaller subset, but that'll be really interesting to see, too. How much do these fish move around in the lake? How, how much, like, how many miles do they cover? We haven't dug into the data yet. Um, lake trout are sometimes thought of as homebodies, kind of like sticking within their porch. But um, I, I predict there'd be some movement. Well, you got a bunch of notes here. We've got about two minutes left. Is there anything from your notes that we haven't asked you about that you wanted to cover before we let you go? You know, we I think we touched on everything. And then I just wanted to emphasize for any uh, folks that encounter one of these tagged fish, the importance of calling in their catch and sharing that tag number if it's really uh, contributing to um, contributing to the science and we need the anglers out there so obviously the orange tag you said dissipates after how long one of the uh so i'm not exactly sure but um that one's it's not built to last so they have to obviously creel the fish at that point in order to find the transmitter yes yeah the tag's gone right yeah yeah so this is if someone is harvesting a lake trout you'll be able to see it when you cut it open we got a question here from Jim, and this is a good question. The lake trout stocking, what strain are they currently stocking in, in Lake Ontario? Um, so uh, th they're still stocking uh, a mix of strains, predominantly uh, Seneca. Okay. Is that kind of thought of as the closest to what we would have had originally here? Or? I don't know if the if the closest um, through time they've done quite a bit of experimenting with different strains mm -hmm. and based on the conditions that we have in Lake Ontario, uh, the presence of sea lamprey, those ones were um, seeming to do the best. But that's still ongoing work as well. Very cool. Well, awesome. We appreciate you stopping in. We appreciate the work you're doing, and uh, hopefully you can be more successful. And you know, maybe next year we have you come back and you'll have some of this data because. I think it'd just be interesting to see how much they move around in the lake, and and maybe it's not at all. Maybe they just hang out. But uh, yeah, you think I mean, they'd move around with with the bait, you know? Yeah, observation. Definitely. And uh, especially when it comes to uh, the fine scale movement of when they're spawning and what areas they're going to. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to come back and share that. Awesome. Well, thank you. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so you're, much. You're excited about your work. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you have a job that doesn't feel like a I job. Tell. Thank right? you. Right? Awesome. <laughs> work. I didn't even know. Yeah, we knew you wouldn't. <laughs> well, thanks again. Awesome. Thank you.
All right, one more guest before we're done here, and he's hanging out here. I can see him in the background. It's Rob Westcott. He's, we'll bring him on in just a second. Again, one more shot here to uh, put in hashtag Captain Pete and get your name into the drawing for Good job. the Fish Hawk. Good job. Yeah, thank you for the Fish Hawk swag patch. Go ahead, Rob. Come on over. Hey, Rob. You want to butt in? Bring some notes with you, Rob? Of course. You can borrow mine. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but no, Pete, you cannot have the King Salmon movement information. I know where you were going, and you could we maybe we, they would give that to you, but there would be a five-year tournament moratorium placed on you where you would not be allowed to participate. So let's just get that out of the way right now. They got some cool stuff with the sensors all over the lake, and there's a lot of movement stuff. Being done and again, really do, do that through the Kings, yeah, you know, qualified for like the, at that level commitment. Yeah, just think it's pretty wild. Biology with you. I, the lake trout stops probably. Well, I guess once it's done and completed, it's gonna be pretty cool to at least see. So, Lake Erie was was doing this a little bit. I think they had a Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. they, they were the same program, right? yep. like the guys on the hook. So, the same, uh, same exact thing, but. Erie has a lot of historical data on the movements, and I've seen the movements from the guys I know, and it's pretty cool where they seasonally how they oh, do this. And of course, we want to know that on Kings. I know exactly. Right. What are they doing right now, Pete? Right? <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> we think they're out. Well, <laughs> we know. We don't know. Right? We, we don't, don't know. know. We want to see those know, seasonal habits. Nice to know what triggers that. Right. If there's a you know, year after year, there's something that triggers that inward migration, or is it just yeah. timing? Yeah, timing, you know, right? Water temperature. What is that? Right. It'd be cool to know. See, they go to the North Shore and then they go to Tom Allen's world, and do they come back? Right. Some of them. Right? Yep. We just really right. it's, it's, throughout the season. Obviously, we all there's more. We'll say love for King Salmon. There is, and that would be great. We pay the bills here. Be great. Right. That's goal. what the attention is to get before I wrap it up in my career. Where it's useful. Huh? Yeah. I don't know. I think the, the cool thing about lake trout is they live longer. So you, you can put that in them and, and you right, get more data. Right. You, know. you might get 10 years out of, right. out of them versus King where maybe you got two years of data because obviously you want them big enough. So yeah. you're going to get a one-year-old fish. You're going to tag them. You might get two more years out of them, right. maybe. Yeah. So, but he needs that data. Right. Nice to have. I'd love to see it. So they did some stuff, um, and I believe it was done on Michigan, um, where they tracked them, and it really showed some daily movements of how far. I mean, uh, 5 a.m., they're in 60 foot of water. We assume that they're feeding on bait. Mm -hmm. And then three hours later, they're 300 foot down, you know, eight miles offshore, and obviously cold water. And, and that's in just one day. Yeah, you know, so there, there was a lot of that cool data. Like, interesting. It's nothing to them to move. You know, right. where you don't see that with lake trout. You know, that that daily movement or hourly movement as much. So, very cool to see. Yeah. Well, this is it, man. This show is going to be over. Our show is going to be over in about fifteen minutes. But the Greater Niagara Fishing Expo is going to be over in about an hour. Uh, what's the show been like for you, Rob? It's been fun. It seems like it's a been a blur. We've had a lot going on. Um, Pete and I have been spending a lot of time together lately. Right. Um, but yeah, it's been, been very busy, very I'm busy tired. weekend. Mentally, yeah. mentally tired, you know, after we speak. Yeah. Weekends. Tired. It'll be nice to, uh, sleep in my own bed. Right. So tell me about the school. Um, what was the school? What was it like for you going through the experience? But I think more importantly for our audience is what, what was it like for, Someone who came to the school, what kind of experience did they get this year? Um, I think that, obviously, when you put three guys in a room, spent a, a lot of time on that lake, um, we experienced it in our planning sessions, how different that we might do things. At the end of the day, the success might be the same. Three different ways of doing things. They're similar. Um, we're, we're using the same tools, but getting there might be a little different. And then... Uh, we start picking at each other and wondering why, what, you know, really trying to get to the root of, you know, we've, uh, I mean, we, we spend all this time creating a, a PowerPoint presentation 
And many times we had to stop and just kind of, you know, sit back and ask Casey, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. You know what I mean? Like pick his stuff up. Same thing with Pete. They did it to me, you know, and the amount of time that we, it was like chucking a grenade in a room and you know what I mean? Everybody kind of sits back and we probably spent double the time. If, if we just sat down and just did a PowerPoint presentation and got our work done and got out of there, it probably would have taken us half the amount of time, but. The time that we took to stop and go, wait a minute, what do you do? What do you do with that one? And then we would say, let's not talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> we will not finish our right. presentation. So let's just get this over right. out of our system and then right. move on. Yeah. But it happens and any time. So we're going like a beer break, right? Yeah. We literally, and then another 20 minutes, and then we'd run in another one of these. Odd. <laughs> 25 minutes of discussion, how, what, what, and then like, okay, we can't do this again. This right. Is, no, no, no. We have our system. Yeah. And there was there was one slide that we absolutely were like we cannot do this we cannot do this at the no we're just going to go fast you say your thing you say your piece and you say your piece and we're going to move on so what did you learn from the experience what you, that you're going to take back to your boat this year hmm that's a good question um maybe i might try uh there was a lot of discussion about hooks we so we did a, a q a this morning mm -hmm. and uh we had a pretty in-depth conversation about um, hooks. Um, Casey and I are on one side. Pete has his way of doing things. Maybe he uh, gets Casey and I to try his method of doing things. So it's always worth looking at. I mean, I think as fishermen, we're always, I don't know, experimenting. We see new things. We got to try them. There's, there's a lot of things that pass and fail our systems. But when we see those things, we got to try it. If it's going to up our game, we got to at least see what it's about. You know, um, what do you, what do you the, think? Tell us about the, the hook thing that you do differently. Um, so, one of the questions or a, a big topic is just uh, meat rigs, treble hooks versus double singles. So, Pete is a, he has a double single system that he likes to use. Uh, personally, I've, I've just always done a, a single treble and it's worked for me. And, uh, Mr. Scientist over here is throwing a bunch of stuff at us. And so Just it might be worth looking at food for thought. Yeah. And you heard a little bit independent thought process. We had so a, yep. outside of me and, yep. um, yep. Guys do stuff different, right? Just trying to help you out. Okay. Help out I like it. I, you know, or at least, at least, uh, and keep, keep an open mind. Let's just say it that way. Right. Yep. That's right. It may not be for everybody, but it's helping. Yeah. Do you learn anything? I did. I already knew he had a super clean boat, very well organized, nice, which indicated he was OCD. But mm -hmm. now I know he's very OCD. Yeah. Uh, he can handle a PowerPoint, which I didn't know. So I, I probably should have just gave him the whole project, <laughs> you know, and said, "I'm not volunteering." You can, you can dump forty hours on that. You're good. I'm good. But I didn't know that, mm -hmm. so I learned that. Uh, if it happens, it's good under pressure when things are probably going to happen again in a month. Yeah. So we, I said, hey, next March is yours. Yeah. So, so, so the next one. We're just going to take the bull by the horn and prepare that PowerPoint. Which took a couple of good things I learned. Yeah. He's intense. He's competitive. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew that. But now I definitely know that there were little power sessions. Yeah. Okay. And uh, respect him. was a fisherman, really. In his mind, he's. Yeah, it was good. I don't know a lot of time with these guys. Put their homework in. They think about processes. Mm -hmm. They don't just do it. Right. And then, oh, it gets fresh. But there's a process involved. So I got to saw, see his thought process. And very prepared guy. Mm -hmm. So I, like I, Thank you. I appreciate it. Good. Compliments, silly. Good. Do, you think, do you think being OCD is a helpful trait to yeah. be a charter captain? He's OCD, so. I am OCD as much as my time will allow me. Yeah, I agree. But. Like when Trevor did the camera shoot on my boat, you know, we, we talked about being able to go in your cabin and find that spoon that is good instantly because you know where you put it or you break the hook off, you know, right where the hook container is, right where the bead container is without. Right. Sure. Like a lot of guys. I, I tell I, everybody my boat's organized so I could send you to go get it. You know what I mean? Down that, their left second row. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's how I can find it. I get some new to find it. So we had that similarly. Similarly. It helps I, I it helped me be a better fisherman. Yeah. Mentally. Correct. Right. And prepared. Yeah. The other thing I learned about you in the last month or two, you know, just talking behind the scenes, it was Westcott guy any good. 
Um, is that you're a big box slayer? You're a big <laughs> whitetail guy. We had a hell of a year. Yeah, so. tell me. I, uh, my, I mean, I guess the highlight for me with that would be my uh, my kid really wanted to stop it up this year. He kind of took a little hiatus. You know, he just graduated high school a couple of years ago, and uh, he kind of wanted back in the game. Loves fishing. First mates all summer long or all season long. Um, he's got the hunting bug. Kind of back, put, put that on the back seat this year. He wanted in. Um, so we really put him back in the game. Um, fortunately, I shot, a, I shot a good buck early in bow season here in New York. Um, after not having success early in Ohio, um, he kind of let me concentrate on him a little bit. Mm -hmm. He scored, you know, so I was thinking, oh, hey, great, you know, two for the team, you know, we're up and, uh, it, we just kept rolling. So, um, and I'm going to interject. I, I know why he's successful in hunting. Also, he's prepared. So like planning, prepared mentally, the whole thing. So, like, the whole process is, uh, hey, make sure we got extra click advance. Or I, I got two. Oh, he whips off the I got spare batteries. You know what I mean? Like, HDMI cable, extra computer. That is a backup computer in case mine dies. Like, yeah. prepared. Yeah. 100%. 110%. Oh, yeah, I mean, hunting for me. He's not a wing it guy. I think, like, fishing. Like, uh, I mean, here we are. Um, we're, we're months away from really our season kicking off, but you know, there's preparations being done. Um, rods and reels are getting restrung. You know what I mean? That prep work starts then, not when, once the boat's in the water, you're not putting new line on reels while the boat's floating there. Um, same thing with hunting, you know, uh, hunting usually starts, I would say right now. So I do a lot of prep work right now. Um, it's kind of the off season, obviously, but there's a lot of telltale signs of the deer woods now. That goes away in the summertime. Obviously, my attention goes elsewhere, but I don't need to be in the woods in July. And then I know that I'm ready uh, late August. Cameras go back out. We start, you know, knowing what's there. And so. So, yeah, if he kills a monster buck or 10, it's, it's not, it's more skill or preparation. Than buck. He's one of those guys. Mm -hmm. So you can comfortably say that. I could comfortably say that. It's a compliment. Love hunting. So. It's definitely, definitely a different pursuit, but we got uh, some questions coming in here. This one's from Jim Lemon, and uh, Jim wants to know uh, how has fishing changed, uh, salmon fishing changed on Lake Ontario over the past twenty years. I'll start. I think the big thing is uh, we're, we're really seeing a, a big difference in spring king catches. Um, so spring king fishery has just been amazing. And it doesn't have to be in the west, the far west end of the lake. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing a little less of the transition. So we're seeing some fish, a lot of fish being caught in April. And June, which used to be a head scratcher at times, like month. Yeah, we used to have all these kings in May, and then June would show up, and we kind of went, wait a minute, what's going on? Thermal client would set up, thank God, all right, we're back in king fishing. It seems like once we start rolling, it continues. Um, the opposite of that is that that's late season. Um, the staging fishery seems to lag a little bit for us, um, where we used to really push it well into even October, mid-October of fishing. Um, Personally, I'm more of that early September. I'm done for the season. So I might make it a couple of weeks into September. Um, but that's a lot different from 20 years ago where I'd push it well into October. And, you know, we're still catching fish and fishing's good. But I don't know. Maybe some of that's interest, too. But I think that that tougher staging fishery on the west end, um, I don't know. It, it's definitely different than it was 20 years ago. And I'm sure you've seen a big change in things too. Yeah, we've seen, uh, you know, tactics, some little tactics have changed, which is uh, bad for the fish, good for the angler. Mm -hmm. Pan optics, things, the electronics have advanced. You guys are at Fishhawk are advancing and you know, moving the needle. So those are some physical equipment change type things. And then, like, last year was kind of a weird year with some uh, mature kings inshore late or mid-September, and then a bunch of mature kings out in the gonzo land, yeah. way out in the middle of the lake, and us going, like, why? I'm not sure what. 
So that was kind of at least a curveball in the past year. Interesting. Mm-hmm. They have inshore and offshore. When I say offshore, way offshore. Yeah, mature, king. Mature, right. Dark, nasty, you know, fanged, adult occurring way out there. And then in 60 to 80. So that was a little bit of a curveball last year. Yeah, Pete's specifically talking about the big boys tournament out of the Oak where we saw that. very. Yeah, that, was exactly. a, that was a highlight of that week. That and then week, we saw we a got, little bit um, no. when we got back. On the, the Wilson area, that still like, what are you guys doing out here still, right? So mm-hmm. you just never know. Lake keeps you on your toes. I, th- bad thing. I think fishing's great. I mean, I would certainly take the fishery now as opposed to 20 years ago. Um, got anglers are smarter. Technology has grown, um, but guys are smarter out there. You know, and like um, like you said, that typically June to mid June was. Grindy, little risky booking trips because uh, right. we might be fishing for some straggler king, some steelhead, some cohos, you know, scratch box fishing, right? Yeah. To where pretty doggone good. Yeah, uh, so uh, was yeah I like June. So I don't. I ain't got no problem with June. Right. No, so that was a change. We don't. We don't see the offshore breaks like we used to. Yeah, hard, heavy, hard, heavy offshore. Uh, slip yeah, that. I remember when I came up here in the night, early, early 90, 1990, actually, we had right. bronze eye breaks, go chase, top water, right. steelhead action. action. Yeah. The breaks are not, yeah. that's and dissipated. Mm-hmm. In the so no yeah. that wow. And it might be just the lake warming up a little bit differently. Um, those shorter winters, like this year, minus the fact that there's eight, eight inches of snow out there right now, but it's been a pretty mild winter. So, yeah. All right, here's one from Scott. Scott wants to know, uh, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, using those treble hooks and meat rigs. Do you see the fish escaping on the retrieve more than with single hooks? <laughs> I knew this would be fun. So, no, we, we as far as single hooks, we'll, once that fish gets by that initial, uh, 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 and you get to that rod, you're you're probably 90% that fish is coming in that. It's, it's that green. It's just that initial, which you see trouble yeah. fishing, spoon fishing, yeah. copper fishing. Once you get past that and that fish is hooked up and that, that fish is taking line, my co- I, I'll go up to the dash and say, I'm confident, even with customers on the box. That's how confident I am once they get past yes. that initial. It's, I have a way higher confidence level thing. Yeah, and it's really just that initial thing. So trebles versus singles, it's always been a debate. Um, you know, you go through some old timers boxes and you'll see a lot of single hooks. Um, once they're hooked with a single hook, they're, they're not coming up. That's, that's whether you're, so. you're still hit on a spoon or yeah, a lake. Yeah. It doesn't matter what ball. rig it is, what you're fishing it's with. Yeah. One, yeah. 100%. But, um, the, the other side of that, I think you put more hooks in fish, certainly with a treble hook, but once they're hooked and you're actually fighting them. So we get past that maybe. 10 seconds, that first initial reaction, yeah, I would say your landing ratio is certainly better. So at the end of the day, it's what makes it to the box in my book. Did it take 15 shots or 12 shots or 12 shots and 15 shots? But if I can land 12 and you can land nine with yours, I, I win. Right, you know, right, right. It, not win-win, but that's my goal is to improve my landing percentage regardless of how many shots it takes or vice versa. I want to end up with more fish on my boat. So I just, I feel a comfort level now that I've gone through testing several types of hooks, knowing what I like on that hook versus the ones I don't like anymore. I saw the differences and the reasons why they let me down a little bit more than I thought. And then talking to guys, asking them like we did this morning, what's your percentage for meat fishing would you feel? When you start hearing 40 to 60%, yeah, we did, we did some polling this morning in the so, room. So. But, you know, I talked to other guys. And it was kind of a, I have a spur of the moment polling. Yeah. Today, yeah. And I was like, we had so many meat me guys in there. I'm yeah. like, let's just ask them. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe I would have heard the opposite. Like, we're like 80. Right. You know, so, st- I would say stick with it. So. I had to think about it. But, but when I saw how many guys put their hand up that were probably under 50% or under definitely under 60 and under, and a lot of 40% of guys, it was like, it's going to hurt you to try it. Right. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's all. I'm not going to coach you. I'm not going to force you. It's just right. opening the door. Open the door. And if, if, if you try and don't like it, okay. And if it works great for you, hopefully I help too. You know, all right. That's all good. Last question. 
we're we're hitting. Uh, this is it. Yeah, this is it. All right. Well, you said something earlier that I thought was a little interesting, which was uh, your son's your first mate. Yeah. So tell me what that's like, and and how that uh, how that affects your relationship <laughs> outside of off the boat. So. Uh... So I, I have a few first mates, my son being one of them. Um, it's got, it's kind of grown into it a little bit. Um, I, I would say when, once he hit about nine years old, that was about the time period where he could really stand being on the boat for the full day. Um, so we back it up and we, we, you know, we do some fun fishing, derby fishing, the same thing. I'm sure Pete's gone through the same thing where you get some time on the boat, you know, he'd jump to the boat nice and early probably take a little nap, wake up, we'd feed him some Doritos and, you know, some Mountain Dews and he'd hang. But um, once he got to about 16, 15, somewhere in there, um, uh, my doc mate started grabbing him a few times to, hey, I need a first mate, need a first mate. And he started making a little bit of money at it now. Now he's getting paid to do something that he absolutely loves. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest feeling in the world, right? right? So, and he really latched onto that. He's learning a lot. Um, and it's getting to the point where I'm starting to pick up some stuff from him because I, I feel that sometimes we might know too much or we think we know too much. So we wouldn't do things a certain way. No, we won't run that because the sun is doing this and it's cloudy or whatever the case is where he doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So he's like, no, I'm going to run this. And then that's dynamite for the day. So, um, or something. yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, hey, you get me out of my element and challenge me a little bit. And I think that that's important. So sometimes being the boss on the boat isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And having somebody that challenges that, which is certainly your bloodline, you know what I mean? He's going to challenge me at every step of the way. It's a, it's a good feeling. So he loves the tournament fishing aspect of things. Uh, loves being outdoors. Um, at, he, he started working for my other business, so he's taking his enjoyment to that, too. Um, so it's a good feeling. So yeah, I, he, I like sharing time with him. Will he be a captain? It's a discussion, so it, it looks that way. So I, he's got the bug. I, I, God bless him. He's got the bug. So right, it's pretty awesome that he enjoys his time out there. Like I said, he, the kid loves fishing. So he loves being out there, um, lo loves every aspect of it. The, the competitive aspect of things, um, he's really gotten a, a taste of that fishing with me. Loves that, the tournament scene and doing all of that stuff. Um, he's got it. So I like to see it. So he's way beyond where I was at his age. So I'll give him that too. So Luke, what's been your experience with that? With the uh, kid? With your son, yeah. So, yeah, it's probably similar, except uh, I got to get him out of bed in the morning because he's not very excited to go. So yeah. it's, it's just, let's go. We got to get going. And then, uh, yeah, a little doze off here and there. But once he's once he's There's awake. There's similar age. What, how old is he? He's eight. Okay. So once Mine's he's, 21. So he's awake. Once he's awake and alive, he's he's good. <laughs> keep him moving. And uh, I like he, he takes, he wants to. Uh, he wants to take the bull by the horn some days. Like, hey, can I can I pick out the diver beach, right? And uh, first, the end, obviously, you want to say no initially, but then you think like, no, go, like for that reason, go ahead. And he's he's picked out a couple of lures over the years that I would not have picked, and it worked. And then you get the, you see, I told you, or and it's good. And but but you learn like now I feel confident in that lure because I would never put it, but you did, and I you made that lure a player in my arsenal. And I probably would never pick the loop. But so you gotta you gotta you gotta give them a little rope. Right, yeah, yeah, you gotta, yeah, yeah right. You gotta let them have a little response. I get I get stubborn on that stuff. Like, no, you gotta tell me why you wanna run that. He actually my son this year, um, my number one spoon for the year came because of his introduction of that specific spoon to me. So and we wrote it out for the year. So I think that says a lot, you know. But yeah, he likes to Test things out. I'll, I'll be honest with you. He might have had more hours on the water this past year than I did. Wow. So because of working, he, he works for my doc mate also. So, mm -hmm. you know, sharing that water time and basically doubling his time on the water, he might have had more probably time helps, on the water. Probably helps. So your boat experience with him, yep. him bringing some of that to you, like yep. said, right? Yep. So my kid, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with it, but 
similar similar situation with them. The whole process of uh, you feeling like your kid was way ahead of where I was at right. his age. Yeah. Same way, like when 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 I first started salmon fishing in Lake Erie, cohos were just introduced, like in seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty. It was all brand new. So my dad and I started ground zero together. We we're every, it was all oh, you know, learned everything together, so, right? And so he kind of faded out, lost interest in it, and I I kept it going. Whereas my kids got the advantage of you know thirty years or whatever it is right. of this is how we do things. I yeah. cut the learning process right. way down for you, right. and you can you can improve on it, and but you're going to benefit from it. Right. So my kids spoiled, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, they're spoiled. Like if they had to do the same things, like I, I, we were doing a brown trout seminar earlier and I was, I mentioned the fact of fishing 13 rods on my buddy's family's open bow boat that they uh, water ski from, you know, when I was like 15 years old, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so my kid's spoiled by what he has in front of him and you know, what he knows because of that. So uh, well, that's awesome. We really appreciate you coming on Rob. This is the second time this weekend yeah, and I appreciate all the work you did with the school. I think you, like I said, I was talking to people today, and everyone had great things to say about what you guys did this weekend. So uh, appreciate we had that. a good positive response. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, Pete, thanks, thanks for hanging out for a couple hours with Pete, us today. Pete, it's been fun. It's been fun. Appreciate it. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you uh, this yeah, weekend. Few, yeah, a few weeks. A few weeks. All right, let's draw that prize. We got 33 entries in there. Let's see who our winner is. What are we giving away? I missed that part. It's a fish hawk, just a swag package, some stickers, okay, towel stuff. Jim Lemon, I think Jim has won before in the past, but hey, he hasn't won this weekend, so he's in there. Jim watches every time we do this. Every oh, really? So he is a diehard viewer of this show. So do- I'll go back this week and I'll watch him when I'm sitting in the office. I'll go back and revisit, and that's yeah. my chance to watch him. So there you go. So Jim's a sponge. Is that what Jim saying? is a sponge, man. He is here every year we do this, so we appreciate him and uh, appreciate everybody who watches this weekend and, of course, on the podcast as well. Uh, Just thanks to everybody. We're going to pack up and head home. Uh, We've got some snow to get through to get to the airport, but uh, hopefully we get out of here tonight. Uh, We'll talk to everybody next time. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody who visited with us this weekend. It was a lot of fun.